YouTube automation changed my life. And in this course, I'm gonna be giving you guys everything I've learned over the last eight years, having built over 25 channels, not only just that, having done over 400 million views and having monthly figures like this and daily figures like this. I'm making this course because I know that there were people like me who grew up and had nothing, no help, no money, no knowledge, no connections, no access to anyone that can tell them that there are other ways to build wealth online. I'm giving this all away for free. This course has information that's worth thousands and thousands of dollars. I'm just giving it away for free. Because if one person can go through this whole course and build a successful channel and change their life forever, it will be worth it. Because when I grew up, my mom, my dad, they were filing for bankruptcy. They came from a different country to Australia. They had to struggle. They had nothing to look forward to. And now it is our chances as we grow up to change our destiny and to do the right things and actually be successful. This course will teach you everything you will ever need to know about YouTube automation. You do not need to buy another course. This is for free. Don't, don't get caught up in those free uh, those courses that they charge you hundreds or thousands of dollars just to use them. This one is free and you will know everything about YouTube automation after this course. To caveat that though, the people that will succeed with YouTube automation will be able to sit through a course like this and actually absorb all the knowledge. If you can't sit through this course and learn from someone who's been doing it for eight years and giving you the blueprint on how to do YouTube automation for free, then I have to be honest with you, you're not gonna make it. You won't make it in entrepreneurship, you won't make it in making money. And, and, and there's a lot of things that it shows about your own character. So if you're serious about it, you're real, you wanna change your life, you wanna do YouTube automation and you wanna do it right, this course is for you. We're starting this course through all the modules and you're gonna be an expert with YouTube automation after you finish this course. The modules are gonna be eight, there's gonna be eight of them. First module is gonna go through overviews of YouTube automation. The second module is gonna go through things like niche selection. Third one's gonna go through stuff like content, how do you pick the right content, what's good content. Number four, we're gonna go through video optimizations, thumbnails, headlines, all that kind of stuff. Number five, we're gonna be going through growth. Six, we're gonna be going through scaling through freelancers. Number seven, we're gonna be doing a deep dive into copyright and how to keep yourself compliant with YouTube automation. And number eight, we're gonna be talking about emerging trends with technology for YouTube automation, things like AI and how you can use that to better for you. I wish you Godspeed. I hope you smash through this course, learn everything that I have done, and so you can take it for yourself and get started and build something. Good luck. Welcome to module one. In module one, we're gonna be doing three parts and it's gonna be an overview of YouTube automation. Now, to preface the whole course, the whole course starts off general and as we go through the course, it's gonna be a bit more deeper, more concepts, more things, and it will build your knowledge from foundational to expert so that when you're done with this course, you don't need any more information to get started with YouTube automation. Now, what's YouTube automation? This whole section is gonna be an overview of YouTube automation. And so I like to use this way to explain what YouTube automation really is. YouTube automation is basically a business. It is, I take money inputs to create content and the output is a video. This video gets uploaded to YouTube and it makes money. And I take that money that I make from the video minus my costs is my profit. Where if I was, a, let's say for example, I was in e-commerce in e -commerce and I was selling t-shirts, t-shirts are the product. In YouTube automation, your video is actually the product. And so this, this module 1.1 is gonna be that overview. And so basically, how do we think of automation? Automation basically means hiring or using tools or, or finding ways to outsource all these parts that, that are used to create a video. So let's say me, I know how to edit, I can make thumbnail, thumbnails, I could do script writing, I can, you know, these are all the parts of YouTube and I could do them all. Now that's tough by yourself. Whereas now, if I hire an editor, I hire someone who gets my research and does my scripts, I hire a thumbnail artist, I've outsourced it. 
thereby making this channel automated, YouTube automation, right? And instead of just like hiring people, there are also some tools that I can use. Let's say, for example, I don't want to talk in this video. I don't want to be the one that's doing the voiceover. I can use AI tools to do the voiceover for me. That is a form of automation. And so automation is very general. It just means finding ways to streamline, to automate, to get other people on board, hiring, all that kind of stuff, where you are having a less, like less um, time is spent from you doing all the content, doing all that kind of stuff, and you're maximizing two of the most important parts, which is what are the what is the content that you're going to be doing? What's the content ideas that are going to get your people that are watching your audience? to watch and love and follow you and your channels. And the second part is maximizing your revenue. So finding a way, finding out ways to maximize the money that is coming from a video that you upload, your product. And we'll go deeper into all the ways that you can monetize and make money from YouTube. But that's basically a very easy way to understand what YouTube automation is. Right, I would rather focus on content ideation and maximizing revenue versus doing all the editing, the script writing, all that kind of stuff where I can get someone else to do that for me. Um, and that's basically a big thing. That's what YouTube automation is. So if somebody asks you, you know exactly what it stands for, right? The second part with YouTube automation is there's always a balancing act. You do want to automate 80% of it but there's 20% that you can never automate. It has to be done by you. So by definition, it is a bit more passive. It definitely is passive, comparatively passive to owning a channel or like a, a, a full business. Where, But with automation, you're able to get to a point where you are doing 20% of the work versus 80% of the work. And the main thing as well is like, you still wanna be authentic. You still always want to think about the people that are watching your videos and thinking about what they want to see, not creating garbage just for the sake of creating a video. That's a lot of a big mistake that a lot of you people that do automation from, from a very, very substandard point of view is you go, just upload, bro. Just get the videos out. That's not how you do YouTube automation. You have to be authentic. You have, still have to have value in your videos. You still have to have videos people want to want to watch. Not, not 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 garbage. Nobody wants to watch garbage, and your retention will show that. But we will get deeper into all of these topics through this course. And so, from a five point perspective, YouTube automation is minimal direct involvement. By minimal, I mean. 80%, 85% is done by others or AI, and you're doing the 15% that matters, right? It's a lot of it's outsourcing it, outsourcing content creation from people that are better than you at editing, uh, at doing thumbnails, at getting metadata, SEO, all that kind of stuff, Getting, giving that to the people that can do that better than you, but you control the parts that nobody else can do, aka strategy for content and maximizing monies. Number three, there are tools like to, to streamline publishing. We'll talk about those all. There are tools to get all this feedback from um, your, your videos and to get feedback on comments, likes, engagement. And then you, what you could do is you take this engagement data, you take all this data, and it lets you figure out what is the best content that we can make for the audience that are right now watching our videos. Let me say one thing. I have done this over for over 25 channels. And people say you have to be lucky to succeed on YouTube, which is the biggest load of bull that I've ever heard in my life. There is no such thing as luck when it comes to YouTube automation. There's three things. It's consistency, it's value, and it's actually being able to get to a point where you're profitable so you're reinvesting that money into making your channel as good as it can be. Anything else, people are just they're just trying to make some, make some stuff up because there is no such thing as luck when it comes to YouTube automation. I can tell you that for a fact. And actually, anyone who has been successful in YouTube automation can tell you the same things. They say there's a little bit of luck, but it's actually very minuscule. 85 to 90% of it is what you do, the inputs you put in, having the right people, having the right content. I can guarantee if you make the best videos, there is no chance that you will fail in YouTube automation. It's just impossible. Because if you're making the right video, people are enjoying your video, they're engaging with your video, and they're coming back for more, you have a recipe to succeed with YouTube automation. And now, there are a few different varieties of YouTube automation. 
you have faceless channels and you have semi-faceless channels. And they are basically what they are saying. With a faceless channel, you don't have any person, personal appearances from the people that own the channel. Think of a Coco Melon or these facts, uh, fa uh, facts trivia channels, for example. Those are like an example of faceless channels. You never see who the owners are or the ones that do documentaries or do reviews about things. You never really see who they are. Semi-faceless channels are the ones that have very minimal involvement of the person who owns the channel, like a, like a skit or a B-roll footage that comes up here and there of the person that's actually doing the content. But 90% 90, 90 of the content is still automated, outsourced. The editing is still gone to somebody else. The, th the structure behind the video, the script, all these things, the thumbnail is still done by other people. And once again, these are just a couple of examples. You've got the ASMR channels, you've got these faceless news aggregation channels, fa fa facts channels, for example. You've got channels that do documentaries, they go deep dive into specific topics. You've seen these probably before. MMA channels, sport, any sporting channel that do documentaries, or they talk about fighters, or talk about basically. I can guarantee you already know what a YouTube automation faceless channel looks like. And if you want, write down in the comments down below some of your favorite faceless channels, and you will see how many of the biggest channels in the world are actually faceless channels. The ones that are making the most money in the world. Coca Melon, example. Who owns Coca Melon? I mean, we can find out who owns them from Wikipedia or Google, or whatever it may be, but he's not in the videos, right? Everything's outsourced, and he's a very good example. They probably do $200 million a year from a faceless channel. Just think about that. And so let's talk about the pros and cons of automation versus traditional methods. I'll, I'm gonna be as transparent as possible because I believe in transparency. YouTube automation does come with its cons. It's not all pros, but there are some very, very significant pros for YouTube automation. Number one, it's scalable. You can have multiple channels with YouTube automation, all that are producing content every single day. Number two, Passive income potential. Once again, 80% can be outsourced, meaning you're focusing on only the smallest parts, like this 20%, which, which is going to be the parts that actually move the needle, the revenue and the strategy. Number three, consistency. When you have all these systems in place, it's not, it's not hard to be consistent with YouTube. Number four, diversification. When you're a content producer in a specific market, let's say I do tech reviews, it is very hard for me to go from tech reviews and start doing food reviews. Not to say that there isn't an overlap in the audience, but for the most part, there isn't. With YouTube automation, you can have five channels all with different niches. One could be about basketball. One could be about, you know, uh, animal documentaries. The next one could be about whatever the hell you want. It doesn't matter because you are able to diversify your audiences because you are not connected to any niche. You can have multiple niches. And we will talk about niches in module two, and we'll go super deep into niches in module two of how to pick the right niche, how to maximize your niche, how to do competitive analysis to know if the niche you're in is actually a good niche. And we can just say every niche has potential. Number five, time efficiency. When you're automating a lot of these processes, everything becomes more efficient, your time becomes more efficient. But there are some cons with YouTube automation. So your investment is the money that you have to put in at the front to get the to get the channel up and running. It's not cheap to hire people. Let's just say that. Number two, quality control. Yes, automation is awesome, but you give up a lot of quality control when you're not looking into the stuff that's happening for your content. So you always have to be on top of it. Just because it's automated doesn't mean you don't watch the content and still approve it. Number three, there is a less personal connection between you and your audience. That cannot be understated because it's true. You don't have a human person behind the brand, and so people are actually following for the content versus following for the person. Number four, people talk about how it affects the algorithm. I don't personally believe it, but you have to still talk about this because there could be a truth to it. Because yes, maybe YouTube does prioritize real people, real people in the videos. Maybe, that's not confirmed, maybe. Number five, ethical considerations. This doesn't also affect me, but a lot of people it might. With YouTube automation, you have to be very careful with copyright. You can't, you can't be using other people's materials. And so because of that, you have to be very specific about the content that you use or the videos you make, because if you use somebody else's material, your monetization for that video is gone. Now, we have the pros and cons of the traditional method, like building a personal brand, becoming an influencer, becoming a YouTube content creator. Like, like a Kai Sinat, Mr. Beast, Ryan Trahan kind of vibes. Number one, you have an authentic connection. You, it's me and you watching these videos, doing this together, creating this content, it's gonna be different. 
Number two, creative control. If it's your brand, you have to be very creative. You want to be very in charge of the contents, cre uh, the, the creative aspect of your content. You don't want people's input into your content. You want to be like, this is me. This is what I want to do, right? It's very different to automation. Number three, low initial costs. Bro, you can get started with a personal, uh, like a traditional YouTube content, creating, content creator with just, just a microphone and a camera, not even, right? That's all you need, bro. So it's very easy to get started. And number four, once again, we talked about the cons of YouTube automation and the algorithm might have a slight preference for people that's actually have their faces in the videos. Once again, that hasn't been confirmed. The cons is that it's more time intensive. You have to spend more time creating content because it's it's, it's your channel, right? It's you physically. You don't want your channel to be associated with something that you don't want to be associated with. And there's limited scalability, right? You can only create so much content personally. Number three, once again, because there's limited scalability, you can only make so much content, you also have a chance of going getting burnt out because it's you in front of the camera creating content versus other people that are creating the content for you. Number four, this one, I don't know if I still truly believe, but I'll put it here anyway, because with income, with, with automation and with traditional methods, the ceilings have gone so crazy for, for YouTube. You could make a shit ton of money doing this kind of stuff because there are people like KSI and all these these uh, huge people that have taken their audiences from YouTube and built billion dollar brands. So who really knows anyway? There are a lot of tools and services that you will need for YouTube automation. We'll go through it through, through the actual course, but you need stuff to manage projects, project management tools, Google Sheets is what I use. There are some paid ones, but who wants to pay for it? Just use the free stuff. Video creation, there are a lot of software that you can use to create videos. I like CapCut. A lot of people have different preferences. You have audio production, just recording stuff for audio. You have content research. How do you find really cool topics to talk about in your videos or to create videos about? Outsourcing, how do you find people? Automation tools, so how do you get SEO and all this kind of stuff as well? Um, to, and scheduling tools, that's a big thing. Analytics and optimization, you've got YouTube Studio. That's the best one. They'll give you all this data about what's working, what's not working in your video. And when you grow and scale with YouTube automation, the biggest thing is the legal and the administrative and paying people and all that kind of stuff, which is going to be super important, right? If you get to a point where you start making a lot of money, which you can with this course, because you'll understand everything you need about YouTube automation, you're going to need to think about the legal and the administrative side paying your people, the people that are working for you, paying all your bills on time because these are the people that are going to be in, like getting the content that you need to monetize. You have to think about that from now because once you get to that point, you, you don't want to have that as a problem. You want to have the systems in place now. And that's basically module 1.1. We're going to continue in module 1.2 and get deeper with uh, YouTube automation. But what I want to say is, Remember, if there's one thing you have to take away from this module is that one, YouTube automation is not just automating everything. There's no such thing as everything being automated. That's impossible. You automate about 80%, 85%, but you're still in charge of the content strategy and the monetization and paying the people actually that I think about it now. And the second thing as well, the big thing with YouTube automation is remember, YouTube automation is a business. It is not you being a content creator. The product isn't your you. You're not the product. You're not the personal. It's not your personal brand. It's none of that. YouTube automation, the product is, is your videos. So they have to have value. They have to be good videos. Nobody watches garbage on YouTube anymore. So this is what module 1.1. Continue to module 1.2. Welcome to 1.2. I want to say congrats to the people that have made it past the first part into 1.2. We're going to be discussing the, the YouTube ecosystem in this module, basically an overview of the, the algorithm for YouTube automation, platform policies, monetization opportunities, and how you can really succeed with YouTube automation. Because if you understand what YouTube is all about, then you'll be able to succeed with YouTube automation. Now, let's talk about what's going to be in this module. We're going to do a deep dive into the following topics. Understanding the YouTube ecosystem. So for anyone looking to succeed on YouTube, here are what you have to consider when you're doing YouTube automation to succeed. Number two, algorithmic factors. 
How does YouTube's algorithm work? A lot of people say that they don't understand how YouTube's algorithm works. I feel like I can describe to you what YouTube is looking for in the algorithm so you know what to prioritize and make a priority so that your YouTube videos get more views. Number three, platform policies. You need to understand how YouTube actually monetizes your videos, the guidelines, copyright laws, and ethical considerations for, for its platform. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how big a channel is, if you don't follow the platform's policies, then you're going to make no money with YouTube automation. And number four, what are some ways to monetize YouTube channels with, through YouTube automation? We're gonna explore the YouTube partner program, but we're gonna look at other ways actually to make money through YouTube automation. Starting off, YouTube's algorithm is not complicated, right? These are the five things that I believe are the biggest factors for YouTube's algorithm. And anyone who makes videos about YouTube's algorithm will, will take a part of this and try to make a different variety of it. It's all bullcrap. This is what you have to follow. These are the five things you need to follow to understand what YouTube really wants. The CTR, the click-through rate. The click-through rate is basically when somebody sees your thumbnail and your headline as a suggestion on YouTube, what percentage of those people click on your video is your CTR. If 100 people see your video and 10 click, your CTR, your click-through rate is 10%. When your CTR is higher, it shows to YouTube that your content is appealing and relevant. It means people actually care about your content. But that's only the first part. Once you've got them on the video, the second part that has to really matter is the watch time. Now, I can click on your video, but you might have clickbaited me, and I don't like you for clickbaiting me, so I leave your video within the first 10 seconds. And so I didn't watch any video, any part of your video, or I watched a small part of that. And so if the watch time is shit, then, then that's another indicator to YouTube that your video isn't actually, isn't actually giving the people who clicked on it what they wanted. So a watch time is just the total amount of time viewers spend watching your videos. And so with the videos that have the better watch time, YouTube prioritizes these videos and it actually shows them to more people because what does YouTube really want? They wanna make money. They want more people to watch their videos. Why? Because ads, bro, they wanna run ads. And so if they're running ads, they make more money. So if your video doesn't get them a chance to run that many ads, then your video for them sucks and they're not gonna recommend it to more people. They wanna keep people on YouTube longer. It's so simple to think about the algorithm from YouTube's perspective. I am YouTube. I want people to stay and watch videos until they die, basically. Think about it like that. So if your video doesn't actually give YouTube what they want, they're not gonna recommend your video to more people. Number three, engagement. Likes, dislikes, comments, shares, all of this matters to YouTube. That's why every single every single YouTuber that you see, guys, I would love a comment down below saying how much you loved X about this video, right? Because high engagement shows YouTube that your video is valuable and gets people to click, stay, watch, engage. These two that I'm gonna talk about now are a bit different. Session time is how long a viewer stays on YouTube after watching your video. Obviously, if they spend more time on your videos or more, more on more of your channel, then the average session time that they spend with your channel is higher, so they're gonna recommend you to more people. Remember, YouTube sessions are favored by YouTube. They want people to stay on the platform. And the fifth thing is relevance, right? So if you're relevant, if you're relevant and you're fresh as well, like you're you're the first one to cover something, or you're the you 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 make a video about something that's really relevant and people want to see that, and it's gonna have all these people that are searching for it at one time. YouTube goes, okay, this video is about this topic. Let's recommend it to more people. Let's rank them higher because this topic is so relevant right now. If you under, if you just do these five things, it is so hard to fail on YouTube. And now, with with YouTube with YouTube's algorithm and automation. So how do we do this, right? So we wanna, we wanna make sure that our content aligns with these, these five things, like CTR, watch time, session, engagement, and relevance. So we have to plan the content to do that, right? We can't just release content whenever we feel like it. No, it has to have a bit of thought behind it. Use your pink matter between your brain. You have all this, you use your brain. You understand that people wanna watch something and you wanna make sure that they stay watching something for a while and they engage with it because that's what's gonna get you more views. It's so simple. The next thing is consistency. If you upload once a year, you're not gonna grow. I don't, give it, I don't care if you're the best person in the world at making content. You need to upload consistently because YouTube wants to reward the creators that are uploading consistently. Metadata optimization. 
People don't understand how important it is to optimize your video, your headlines, your descriptions, your tags, your even the way you title your video, bro, before you upload it actually all has an impact on the algorithm and gives YouTube more understanding about what your video is going to be. What is metadata? Metadata is just YouTube's way of understanding your video. Right, they want to understand what your video is about. They're not. It's not people usually watching it. So it's the algorithm that gives them a chance to recommend or not recommend something. So give YouTube the best opportunity for them to understand what your video is about, and that's metadata. Trends. So with trends, you can you can use automation trends. Like if you use these tools that exist, you are able to find the trends before other people do. And if you find a trend, you can capitalize on that trend to become relevant, and you could be ranked one for X topic. Right? If you want to be relevant, fresh content that's trending, you need to have systems in place to find these trends. And the biggest thing is understanding your performance. So when you analyze your performance, you're able to have a better understanding of what has worked, what hasn't worked. Ah, oh, these videos have a five minute retention. Well, these ones have X minute retention. Or oh, this has a CTR of 3%, this one has a CTR of seven. You have to take all this data and understand why is this happening? What am I doing that's influencing the algorithm to do this or to do that, for example. And it's 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 all about experimenting as well. You gotta experiment a little bit, right? You wanna try a thumbnail? Try it out, give it a shot. See if this thumbnail performs better. If you find a thumbnail that works, gets you seven, 10% CTRs, that is a thumbnail you should be using as your metric to be like, this is a thumbnail that has worked. Let's make tweaks to it when we upload our next videos. What are some of YouTube's policies that really matter? There's three. You have the monetization policies, you have the ethical guidelines, and you have the copyright laws. Let's start off with monetization. So when you're applying for monetization, what does that really mean? It means to, it means to YouTube that you are saying that your content is advertiser friendly. <clears throat> what is that? So I'm an advertiser. I want to run ads on YouTube. When those ads get run in your videos, you get a percentage of that money that I spent on running the ads, right? That's how this, that's how YouTube ads even work. That's how this monetization policy on YouTube works. But if you're if you're making content that no no advertiser wants to be on, then you're not going to make any money regardless of how good your content is going to be. You have to be within YouTube's monetization policies, and the, there are some factors that you have to hit before you even get monetized on YouTube, and we'll discuss that. Copyright laws. I don't even want to say how many times I've lost thousands and thousands of dollars because of copyright laws, right? Don't mess with copyright. If it's not your content, and or like if it's like if it's content that you know is gonna get struck by copyright, just don't use it. It's not worth it, bro. It's actually not worth it. You will lose thousands and thousands of dollars. Even if you get by, you'll still get claimed eventually. <clears throat> and then the third part is ethical guidelines, right? YouTube creators have to be very, very transparent about the stuff that you do. And if you're doing things that are going to be against the guidelines of YouTube, you're, you're promoting all the bad stuff that YouTube doesn't want on their platform, then you're basically giving YouTube a reason to give you a, a community guideline strike. You don't want those. If you get three of those, your channel's done. Copyright laws is different. If you get a copyright strike, that's that's you're, you, you all, that's also really bad. You get three of those, you're done. A copyright claim, they take your money. That's also shit because if you lose the money that you spent money to get this video ready, but you lose all that money, then you did nothing. You actually lost all that money. How does YouTube figure out who's using content material that's not theirs? There's something called content ID. Content ID is a system that uses, it's a thumbprint system. If you use a song or use a clip or something like that that's not yours, somebody else owns the copyright material, then YouTube will be able to identify it like that. Before even uploading the video, they'll be able to, uh, able to identify it. So be very, very careful. You can't outplay YouTube. So how do you get into the YouTube Partner Program? You need at least 1,000 subscribers. And that's like the, this is the eligibility side. 1,000 subs, 4,000 hours of watch time in the last 12 months. There's also the YouTube Shorts side, but we're not talking about that because YouTube Shorts is very different to YouTube Automation. And you have to comply with all of YouTube's monetization policies. Obviously, you have to make content that is advertiser friendly. But ongoing requirements that you have to continuously be within YouTube's policies. You got to be active, engaging, growing, and you don't want community strikes or community guideline violations. I'm telling you, if you do that, you're going to get murked. So, how does YouTube pay people? One, you've got advertising revenue. Easy. Money from ads that are put on your video or near your content. Channel memberships. 
So if people like your channel, they want to become a member of your channel, similar to a Twitch sub, then they can do the same thing. They can pay you a certain amount of money and become a member to your channel. Three, if you run live streams, you have super chats. So they, in the, they are able to get their chat at the top. You've seen this before. Number four, merchandise shelf. So if you sell brand new merchandise directly through your channel, YouTube shop, all that kind of stuff that's new, I haven't really played with it, but that does exist, then you're able to make some money through that. And obviously you have YouTube premium revenue. So if people are using YouTube premium to watch your videos, you get a percentage of that revenue as well. But these are not the only ways to monetize your YouTube channel. These are the, these are the ways that YouTube monetizes their channel. So your, your channel. So there are multiple ways to monetize a channel that don't involve YouTube, that are outside of YouTube, and we'll talk about them all through this video. But just to give you guys an example of a couple of these, you got affiliate marketing, where you sell other people's products and you get a commission. You got brand deals, which are when you work, if you have a big enough audience, you work with like a like a game or uh, e-commerce brand and you, you put the product in front of people and they give you uh, a, a little bit of money. You can sell physical digital products as well. These are some, a couple of ways that you can also make money. So let's say I sell a t-shirt, I sell merch, I sell a product, a candy bar example. And the fifth way is like content licensing. You can sell your content to other people to license your content, to use it, upload it, and they also pay you for that. But we'll describe all these ones in detail through this course. These are the biggest considerations for YouTube automation channels because you have to remember these five things to actually succeed with YouTube automation. The quality of content must be advertiser friendly and must be within the standards for monetization or else you don't get monetized. And I have had multiple channels that never got monetized. Number two, originality and making sure that you're avoiding copyright material. You wanna make sure that you own the licenses to whatever you're using, one, and two, to avoid any material that's not yours. It is not worth the risk. Number three, audience engagement, right? So you want to you want people to engage with the channel and make sure it looks like it's real. There's not botted views and botted this and all that kind of stuff. Not to say that you are botting, but you want to make sure that you're not giving YouTube any reasons to just demonetize you or get rid of your monetization. Number four, when YouTube makes changes to the policies or the algorithm, you need to work in, in unison with them. You don't want to work against YouTube. You want to work with YouTube. You don't have the you don't have the the ability to just like go to an audience that is your audience and you're able to get a get out of jail free card because your audience loves you because you have a personal brand. No one cares about you if you have a YouTube channel that's all about automation and you're doing videos just for the say just to create content and, and videos to monetize those videos. Why? Because you're not building the same kind of connection with your audience. So you want to make sure that you're being favorable with YouTube so that you're not getting murked when when they change their policies. Uh, and number five, being compliant with any policies that come through and existing policies, monetization, copyright, and community guideline policies. And that's basically it for this module 1.2. I want to say thank you for making it this far. Drop down below what you've learned so far because it's important to share your knowledge with other people that are going to be in the same space, the same place as you. But just to go over it quickly, this is complex sometimes, right? YouTube's policies are not easy policies. They take time to understand to make sure that you're not making these mistakes. I've made so many mistakes with YouTube policies. So many mistakes. So I want you guys to avoid them. Don't be alarmed. Don't be upset. If it happens to you one or twi once or twice, it happens to everybody that does YouTube automation. Regardless, you will have a problem with YouTube's policies eventually. Everyone does. But the main thing is that you try your best to stay within the policies, within the guidelines, within what YouTube wants for, for, their, for, for their platform. Because at the end of the day, if you mess around with YouTube's platform, they will not hesitate to get rid of, get rid of your channel. That is a problem because at the end of the day, if you spend uh, six months, seven months building a channel just to have it taken away from you, I don't wish that on my worst enemy. This is 1.2. I'll see you guys in 1.2. I want to congratulate you for making it to 1.3, the final part of module one. And so in this one, in this module, we're going to be talking about how outsourcing and automation can help you in YouTube automation with operations, consistency, and how you can take these automation strategies so you're getting the right people to do the things that you don't want to do while focusing on the things that matter, strategic growth and monetization. And so how does outsourcing work with YouTube automation? First things first, you delegate content creation and channel management. So for example, stuff like content creation, editing, community management, 
you, you take that and you find the right people or you find the right AI tools that are able to take control of that aspect of, um, of your channel. The second part is you want to scale. So you take this system and then you want to find a whole bunch of people, freelancers um, and, and in various areas so that they can produce more content than one person can. And so these freelancers are going to be people that are going to be, uh, that are going to be doing your editing. They're going to be doing your community. They're going to be doing your thumbnails. They want, you know, they take all the parts of the creation process of a video and they are basically doing that for you. You are the one that's creating the system. The third thing is maintaining consistency. So when you outsource or you're using these tools, you want to make sure that you have content at the same time uploaded at the same days. If you have like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule at 2 p.m., you don't want to miss it. You want to keep it at the same time. And so even if you're not available, that the, the channel still produces content at those times and is uploading content at those times, non-negotiable. With, with outsourcing, you're finding the right people that have the skills that you don't have. That includes people that can do professional editing one, that can do people that have you know a better voiceover, people that can do data analysis, that can do community management, that could do content ideation with you. They can give come to you be like, here are some ideas that have that have come. They can go and uh, research script writing, whatever it may be. Now, some of this stuff can also be done with AI. Like for me, I used to hire script writers. Now I don't have to because YouTube, YouTube um, there are tools that help with YouTube script writing. AI tools like ChatGPT and Claude, they're so, so, so good for writing scripts, but that's just one part of it. The biggest thing is that you want to focus on strategy. When you have the right people that are taking the stuff from you that you don't want to do, you could take your energy and put it into strategy to grow your channel strategically. And also that you're getting the to a point where you're maximizing the amount of revenue that comes from the channel. You want to be profitable, but you want to be growing at the same time. And when you're when all these th things are taken care of, then you're not held down by day-to-day -day operations, aka editing, script writing, getting the right content research done. You can focus on strategic things like where are we going with this content plan? What do we have in the content backlog that is going to get our audience super excited? How can we make the most money that we can from these videos? How do we system, system, system uh, I can't even say the word, systematically use all our resources at hand to get to a point where this machine is growing and building. And actually we could take this machine, take the learnings and apply it to a second channel, a third channel, a fourth, you know what I'm trying to say. And the big thing is that it helps you reduce burnout. It is really hard in business because business is very difficult. You get burnt out. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Same thing as, as a content creator. But when you find the right people that can help you and distribute your workload, then you can keep yourself from burning out. So how does this actually work in real time? How does the workflow look? You start with planning. So me, you, the channel owners of these channels that are doing YouTube automation, we have to think, what are the content ideas? What are the, strate what are the strategic videos that we can make that's going to appeal to this audience? Then we come up with this, this audience in our brain, what they want, these videos, and work backwards. So we have to think about what does it take to make the video? Task distribution. We have to think about each task that's going to be needed to create this video. And that's when you give this to a couple of freelancers. And then you can find these freelancers that are going to be able to do the parts for you. So that's when the content creation happens after you've found the right people. You find voiceovers, voiceover artists, script writers, you know, editors, all that kind of stuff. Now you have a team of people. These people will take your idea. They'll take the things that you want. They'll come back to you with this video. You have to review it, approve it. And if you have enough money, you can have a channel manager that does this as you grow your channel. But at the beginning, you're uploading the video, you're making it go live. You, you, you push it out to people. When all that is said and done, when you get all this data back, you have to do some analysis, see what worked, what didn't work, and then change your strategy to ensure that you're on a, a trajectory going up, not a trajectory going down. These are the job roles that are typically outsourced with YouTube automation. Once you know this, you can do YouTube. You can start automation from today because this is everything you need. For YouTube automation, 
for, to get the channel running. This is not including the legal side and the monetary side and the paying people side and all that other stuff. No, this is just what you need to get from idea, research, get the, get the product ready, the video and upload. So you need someone who can do content research. So ideally that's gonna be you that's gonna come up with the ideas for content. But as you grow, you'll find someone who can identify topics gather facts, do the research, statistics, and ensure everything is accurate about your content while also being engaging. And they can also use AI for this as well. A lot of these things that I've said, you can use AI for, and I've put them here, for where you can use AI. You have script writers. Script writers come, they craft engaging scripts for your videos, and they are optimizing for SEO through metadata and they are optimizing for retention. They wanna ensure the script keeps, keeps them hooked. And in this course, I'm gonna teach you guys how to write such effective scripts where you, if you read a script, you can tell me or not if that script is good or if it sucks and it's not gonna get people watching the video. You'll know all the stuff after this video, uh, uh, during this course, sorry. It's in another module. You have voiceover artists. These are the people that are going to be taking your scripts and they're going to be narrating it with the tone that you want. Once again, this is expensive. So you can find people that can do it for you, but you can also use AI for this. Just to go back to script writers, you can also use AI. AI tools have got really, really good at writing scripts. You just have to feed it the right data, the right research, so then it can write the script for you. You have video editors. They take the footage, they get footage, they put it together, they add effects, they do this pacing, and they keep you consistent across your brand. And we do have a module in this course that goes deep into optimizing video. Thumbnail designers. We create eye-catching thumbnails that get people to click. Once again, we have a, a whole section on this in the video, in this, uh, in this course. SEO specialists. People that are gonna be optimizing video titles, descriptions, tags, all that kind of stuff to give YouTube some context, right? I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but we're gonna go deeper in this on this concept as well through the rest of this course. All of these topics are gonna to get broken down a lot more, most of these topics, sorry, are gonna get broken down a lot more throughout this course, so stay tuned for those modules. But if you wanna to go to those modules, in the description, I've put every single module and where what each part is gonna be about. So if you wanna learn, for example, now how to create a thumbnail, thumbnail art, like thumbnail that's gonna be very good, what does a, a good thumbnail look like, you can go to that part of the video. I recommend if you're starting, just keep watching this course. As you go along, you will learn, you'll get better. You don't have to skip anything. So how do you find people that could do this work for you? I personally prefer Upwork because Upwork is a platform where you can put your price and people will apply to the jobs that you have. If I want to pay someone $2 or $5 or $10 an hour to do my editing for me, I can put that price. It is not against any policies to put that price. What people will apply for, you can work with them because they are happy to work for that price. Same thing with Fiverr. I don't like Fiverr that much to be honest. I prefer Upwork because they come to you versus you going to them. And so you want to put good descriptions on Upwork of what you want, let the people apply, you put your price, how much you're willing to pay for this work, and people will apply, and they know that that's the price that they're willing to do the work for. So when these people come in, they come in, they apply, you message them, you'll find yourself a good editor, you build a relationship with that editor, and they'll help you get better through time. Now, how do you how do you structure your the way you hire people and hire freelancers so that more people will come through? And how do you find the right people? First things first, you need to be extremely clear about the job descriptions. They have to be detailed. You have to really be specific about the requirements and expectations of what your job is going to be. If I'm looking for an editor, I need to be very specific. I need an editor for three days a week that's going to create twenty minute twenty minute long videos about X topic, be specific. Number two, you wanna make sure you look at their portfolio. Don't just skip over it and just hire someone for the sake of hiring. Look at the work they've done. If it sucks, don't use it, don't use, don't work with them. Look, also look at the reviews. See what people have said about their work in the past. Number three, start small. If you wanna start small, I recommend starting small because then you could just work with someone on like a one day thing 
or one video at a time so you can work with them, get better, understand their skills, see if they're really good before you commit to larger tasks with them. Number four, you want to be very good with communication on your side, but you want to also ensure that your freelancer also has good communication skills and can meet the deadlines that you set. But don't be unrealistic about the deadlines you set. You want to be realistic, but you want to have deadlines. So you could be like, this needs to be done in seven days. If it's not done in seven days, then we'll have to have a conversation if you are the right person for me. Number, uh, number five, fair pricing. I personally think that whatever you can afford is the budget you should put. Because with low pricing, you get low quality work. But when you're starting off, that may be okay just to get you in the space, just to get you started, just to get you in your first you know, couple of uploads. But when you start to see some traction, the quality of your content should also be reflective. At the beginning, if you, if you at the beginning focus so much effort and energy on having the best scripts and engaging content and the video editing isn't the best, that's okay. You can start like that. As long as the content, the actual, the, 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 the value of the content actually hits for the people, then it will still get traction at the beginning. Number six, I think, contracts. You want to be very clear what your contracts with your contract with the person about the deliverables, the timelines, and the payment terms. Because I've had multiple times where I've had to use the contract because the person that I hired didn't do what they were obligated to do, and they still wanted to get paid. And that's not that's not fair on anybody. If you're if you are clear about your deadlines and your contract, then they also need to adhere to that as well and give you the work that was agreed upon. At the time it was agreed upon, never neglect the power of a contract between you and an individual that you are hiring. It is so important that you, and if you don't do this, there is a big chance that you're going to get ripped off and you're going to lose money and it's going to leave a sour taste in your mouth. And number seven, a feedback system. Just because you think that you are being reasonable doesn't mean you actually are reasonable. You should have a set structure that you can give to the people to be like, I will, I will give you, a, and a lot of the freelancers will ask you for reviews. So you could be like, based on your work and based on how you, uh, you, you do this stuff, I'm going to give you this as a, like a, as a review to you, right? And so what's going to happen is that these people are going, to imp, are going to work towards ensuring that every part of that is at a five star. And you want to make sure that they do that too. So you can tell them, this is what I look for. And this will be reflected in the review you get from me. And that's basically a simple way to look at outsourcing in YouTube automation. You know, YouTube automation in, its, in itself is in the business of hiring the right people to get the right content out there for you. And so you want to be able to hire people. You want to be an effective leader. There's going to be someone that people actually want to work for and actually enjoy working for. Now, I'm saying that though, there are some AI tools that you can use, but for the majority, I think a lot of YouTube automation will be is hiring the right people that can help you and using some AI tools. But if you're starting off with $0 and you want to just use AI tools for the majority of it, that's fine. You can start off like that. I just think that stuff like editing is going to be very difficult to do with just AI tools. You definitely need someone who knows how to edit a little bit. But if you learn how to edit a little bit and you can use AI tools, you can start off with YouTube automation from basically nothing. You get a script written. Actually, sorry, start off with the content. You get the content idea that you're thinking. You do some research on the content. You get a, a, a chat GPT or a Claude to dive deeper into a topic. You get them once again to then write a script about that topic. It's going to be engaging and have high retention and it'll do it for you. You take that one, you use something like 11 Labs, a free version of 11 Labs, for example, to then voice over. You just snap a little bit of B-roll footage together, upload, get the data and see what's working or what's not and stay consistent. You can do it with no money and hiring nobody. I always have preferred hiring people so they can do the work for me because then there's someone there that you can look to and be like, hey, this is your thing to do. This is your thing to do. We're all working in the system. Because when you get to like 50,000, 100,000 subscribers, it's very hard to do that through just automation, through AI alone. You're going to need the right people. And so this module basically explains how you find the right people, where to find the right people, and how to be, how to set clear uh, objectives, outlines to ensure that the person you hire and you have the same, are on the same wavelength.
And just like that, you've finished 1.3. You have finished module one. I wanna say congratulations. You have gone one eighth through this course and you are on track to being a YouTube automation expert by the end of this course, at the end of this video. I wanna say that a lot of people probably haven't made it this far, but you have. And I wanted to, I wanna to say to you to keep going, keep trying, keep moving forward through this, because at the end of the day, once you finish this, you will never need to watch another course on YouTube automation again. You can get started, you can get started in this journey, start building your channel, start monetizing, start making money from YouTube or automation. Thank you. We're gonna move on to module two. Module two is all about niches or niches, 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 I don't know how Americans say it, niche. The niche is basically what your content's about, what, you, what it, what's it actually like, what's the whole channel's like theme basically. So let's go into two point two, module two, and we'll start off with 2.1. I wanna say congratulations for making it to module two. And for module two, it is gonna be all about niches and niche selection for YouTube automation. So module two is gonna be also separated into three parts. And this is part one. So in this whole, like this part of the course, we're gonna be talking about niche selection for YouTube automation. How do you identify the right niche for building a, a profitable, sustainable, and successful YouTube channel with automation? And these are the topics that we'll be talking about in today's video. Um, we're gonna be talking about what is a niche? Maybe a lot of people don't know what a niche actually is. Why is it important for niche selection? So how do you also identify what niche you should pick? So the criteria we use to pick niches. Are there any tools that we can use to identify niches? How do we analyze competitors? And how do we analyze the saturation in a niche? And then also the last part, the really important part, is evaluating long-term viability. So what is a niche? A niche basically, in the context of YouTube content, is, is basically a specific segment of a very broad market that your channel caters to. It's what your channel's area of focus is going to be, the specialization. An example that I've put here is vegan, vegan meal, meal preps for college students. Other examples could be, I make MMA documentaries for artists, uh, sorry, for fighters in the UFC. I can make MMA document documentaries for up and coming fighters. That's a niche, that's a niche. I can do, for example, game law. So I discuss the game law of games, for example. Whatever it may be, a niche is just a very, very specific segment of a broad market. So let's say, for example, you start off with gaming and you break it down to PC games. It took, break it down to RPG PC games. You break it down to law-based MMA, uh, uh, law-based um, videos on games that are, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. I'm, I went too, too niche and I forgot what I was trying to say, but that's basically what it is. But why is it important that we choose the right niche? One, because we want to make the right content that speaks directly to that, to an, a specific audiences with whatever their needs and interests are. The second thing is it's easier to build an audience but when you know how to deliver content that is tailored to their specific interests. Another thing is, when you niche down, you have less competition. Now, for example, if I, if there's two channels, one makes, they both are in the niches of MMA, for example, but I make MMA content about documentaries, well, he does fighter breakdowns on for MMA fights. We are both in a very broad market, but I have a very different content, uh, content niche than he does. I do documentaries, he does breakdowns. That's an example. It also allows you, when you, when you focus on a niche, it allows you to become an expert in that niche. And so when you become the expert, you have credibility. When you have a specific niche, you're able to monetize better because you can tailor solutions or products or whatever it may be to specific needs of that avatar, the person that is watching your videos. And also a big, big, big thing is YouTube's algorithm is able to better understand your audience when you, have an, when you have content that's tailored to a specific audience, so what can it do? It can recommend you to more people that are very similar to the people that already watch your stuff. How do we decide a niche? You have demand, you have competition, you have profitability, you have if you have expertise or interest, and then the potential for the content. So how do we, do, how do we define demand? Basically, demand is how many people are searching for something, or is there is there a lot of people that are searching for this kind of content? And you can use platforms like Google Google Trends or, or, or Google Search Data or Facebook Groups, whatever it may be. You can use that to kind of get, gather around if there's any demand 
for the specific niche that you're looking to enter. So for example, let's say vegan meal preps for college students has 22 monthly thousand searches. This is not, I don't know, this is, could be true. This could be false. I'll just put these numbers here. Then you know that there's a lot of people there that are in demand for this kind of stuff that are looking for pro solutions to this problem right now. So you can tailor content towards them because if they search it on Google, it'll pop up on uh, with videos for YouTube as well. And if they, if they search it on Google, they're probably gonna search it on YouTube as well. The next thing is competition, right? If you have a lot of very big competitors in the space, it does prove that there's a lot of people watching this kind of content, but you have to remember that you're competing against these people, right? You're competing for the same eyeballs that someone who has 850,000 subscribers has in the same niche that you're in. So you wanna, we wanna weigh and see if you can create better content than the person who's already at the top of this niche, or even the second best, or the third best, or whatever it may be. Can you create better content than them? answering or solving more ideas or more problems or having more interesting concepts for videos than they do. Because if you can, you might be able to compete. The next thing is profitability, right? You might go into a niche that has a lot of viewers, but there's not enough money in that niche because the advertisers aren't willing to be pay, willing to pay to be on those videos. But you also have sponsorship opportunities, depending on what niche you're in. You have products or services, depending on what niche you're in. And then you also have to think about the audience that you have. If you cater to like a college audience versus an entrepreneurial audience, disposable income is very different. Now, another big thing is if you enjoy the niche, if you enjoy the content, if you have a specific set of understanding about a content niche, for example, then you are able to, to, to you know, you're able to take that channel further because you already have a very thorough understanding about the specific topic or the specific segment or the specific niche. And so that makes you someone who can build faster because you know what people want. And so that actually gives you more value when you're picking your niche. If you really know, I like MMA. So if I do content about MMA, it's going to be easy for me because I can find the videos that I know will resonate well with an audience because they like me, for example. So that could be something that you use. If you like cars or you like boxing or you like you know documentaries or you like animals or whatever it may be, it doesn't if, if you haven't experienced with it or you have a personal interest in it, it might help to be that niche that you pick because you can make content for it. And also the potential for making content, right? So there has to be enough content there to make content for, like subtopics within the niche that you can create div like diverse and engaging content. So you want to identify opportunities when you create you know, when you pick a niche to say that there is content potential here. You also have to be very, very focused on creating visually appealing pieces of content, right? You want to create the best thumbnails, the best art, like the best headlines, everything to kind of get people interested, right? So if you don't care about a niche, then there's no point, right? If you can't create a niche that's like exciting and fun to watch, then no one, no one, no one's going to watch it. You could pick a niche like, I don't know how boxes like okay how factories work, and if you don't, if you don't care, there might be people that do want to know how factories work and how this works in a factory, and so there might be a potential there. But whatever the content niche you pick is, you have to be able to find opportunities to find storytelling opportunities to make it interactive, and also to obviously have multiple different formats in there, right? This, the content potential is the least least important thing when it comes to picking a niche, but it's still important because if you don't know where you're going to go with your niche, if it's going to be vlogs or it's going to be this or it's going to be that, then it's very hard to do your niche properly. And here's a couple of tools that people use to uh, do research for niches, like Google Trends is one, Google itself, you've got TrueBuddy, you've got Vid VidIQ as well, Social Blade, Answer the Public. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of ways to find these niches. You can use Reddit, you can use all these things. You can find what people are already looking for, already have communities for, all this kind of stuff, and tap into what they want. How do you find competition and saturation? So the biggest thing is how many people are actually in the same niche that you are? So when you, let's say for example, I'm gonna use the example of MMA documentaries. How many people are, when I type MMA documentaries are in that same space, right? You can use Social Blade to identify what their sub counts are and the view numbers are, but how many people, is there five, is there six, is it seven? The next thing is the quality of their content. Is it good? Can you beat them? Can you make better content than they can? If you can't, it's gonna be very hard to get the viewership because at the end of the day, these people have built massive followings, bigger audiences than you, they have more resources so they can make better better content. But can you make better content than them at their best? Because if you can, you might be able to beat them. How often are they posting? Posting frequency is really important. If they post once a month and there's so much demand for this kind of content, you come there and you post once a week, or you post once a day, 
then you're able to kind of beat them because you can either match or post more when you when you do YouTube automation. Let's say, for example, there's a lot of competitive people in a specific niche, like MMA documentaries. Let's say there are opportunities actually to go add a niche down. You could do, for example, UFC documentaries for MMA fighters or one MMA documentaries, one championship. There's, there's sub niches of niches as well that you can go down. So you might be able to, don't go broad if there's too much competition, actually go more niche, more down because you can always build outwards instead of building inwards. Engagement metrics. Like a big thing is when you look at your, when you look at the people that are competing against you is to look at their likes, you know, if people are commenting, what they're looking for in the comments, you know, high engagement does actually mean that there's a passionate audience about this kind of stuff. Whereas low engagement, low views may, might mean that there isn't a huge potential there for the audience to be built. And that has to be a personal decision that you make to see if there's enough engagement to actually warrant you to go into that market or that niche, sorry. And growth rates. I mean, the main thing is to see how fast these channels are growing. What, what is the best case scenario for me doing this niche? Let's say, for example, the channel's done 200, 300, 400 million views in three years. That's a good that's a good ecosystem. That's a good niche that you should definitely look into. But you can go, you can be sub-niche of that niche. And then also, how do you evaluate the long-term viability of niches? So you could use historical trends to look at how people are searching using Google, uh, Google Trends. You can see if it's going up or going down. You can look at industry projections, people like if people are talking about something, or let's say, for example, you do it once again, MMA, if it's going up through time, that means it's growing. Technological re relevance, so like if, if you're in a tech-related niche, maybe some, some products that they talk about are not as relevant anymore, and it's like, for example, like the NFTs, there was a huge NFT boom, but maybe it's not relevant as much anymore now as it was once, what once was. So they might have grown really fast at the time, but right now, no one cares. Audience demographics, is this audience going to grow through time or is this audience going to die through time? And obviously, if it's if it's growing through time, then it's a favorable niche to be enter, entering. Monetization sustainability. Can you actually make money from this niche? Because the niches that make money will be effective and will always grow through time. Entrepreneurship, finance, tech, like real estate. These are very big niches that pay a lot of money. And so they will never go out of... Out of um, They'll never go out. Like no, they will always be growing. There'll always be opportunities to make money. Um, and then a, a couple of other factors like content diversity, regulatory environment, and seasonal factors. But these are small things comparative to the other rest of these that we've just discussed. I, I've heard this, this saying before, and it's actually really important. Selecting the right niche is a critical step in YouTube automation. By carefully considering many factors, including demand, competition, and profitability, we find niches on YouTube that have insane growth potential. And that's what I want you guys to take away from this. I gave you guys a list of things that you can do to find the right niches or how to pick a niche or how to look at your competitors. At the end of the day, I think that if, when you pick a niche and you go down that niche, you have to remember that you might change through time. That there might be a subcategory that you actually go down to make it less competitive. But at the end of the day, once you've picked the core niche, once you've, once you've identified that niche, think about the audience that that niche serves and think about what kind of content that they want. And that's one, so this is 2.1, module 2.1 completed. Thank you guys for making it this far. We're going to move on to module 2.2. Welcome to module 2.2, audience targeting for YouTube automation success. Now, this whole module is going to be about understanding and effectively targeting the audience because this is so crucial for the success of your YouTube channel and, autom for, and YouTube automation. Basically, this, this whole module is going to be about three main things. Understanding your audience, how do you create content for your audience, and then obviously how you can leverage data and all that kind of stuff to op optimize your automation for your, for your YouTube channel. So the big thing is there's some things called demographics and psychographics for your audience. So this includes stuff like your age, like how old the person is, the gender of your audience, where they're probably going to be located, the language they speak, the money they make, how educated they are, and what they do for work. Because all of this is relevant depending on the channel that you're building for YouTube. Psychographic basically is like, what's their pain points? Like understand the problems and challenges that your audience has so you can create content to solve their problems. That could also just be boredom. Like a problem of mine is I'm bored and I enjoy UFC content. And so that's a pain point of mine that you can solve uh, through a YouTube channel that does, YouTube channel doing automation that does MMA content. What are my interests, you know? 
motivations? What are the reasons that I use YouTube? What is it for entertainment, education, inspiration, finding solutions to problems? You have values, so you got to understand the values of, of the people that are watching your content and to resonate with their core values. Lifestyle, what's a daily routine look like for the people that you want to create content for? The personality trait and their buying behavior, all of these things are so important for YouTube automation and I see nobody talk about this stuff in any courses for YouTube. So how do you research audience demographics? So the, there are several tools that you can use to get insights onto on, on demographics and a lot of things are like age, gender, income, whatever these may be. Some are YouTube analytics, they'll tell you where they're coming from, how old they are most of the time when you have enough audience, uh, when you have enough uh, stuff there. Google analytics, but you can use so many tools online that can help you understand it. And also you could probably use AI tools to help you understand your demographic. And how do you create content that resonates with your target audiences? This is the strategy that you need to use when you're thinking about content that you want to create. So either you address a pain point, so you create content that directly addresses the challenges or problems your audience is facing, where you offer solutions, tips, and insights to improve that, so that problem for them. You match content style to your audience preferences. So you can do like short punchy videos for an audience that prefers quick actionable tips or longer, more detailed content for an audience that values in-depth information. Just it depends on your audience. If they're there for, to learn how to do Facebook ads, for example, you're gonna need a very different audience than someone who's there just to watch a knockout video, a compilation video, for example. Using relevant examples and references. So you wanna incorporate examples and references that your audience can relate to. So stuff that makes them feel a bit more connected. Like let's say, for example, you wanna help people that are doing Facebook. You could be like, if you're like, so for example, this is for X person that's dealing with Y problem. And then you're, solve, you're, you're, you're using a relevant example by saying, I had this person that was dealing with X problem. And then that person might be able to resonate with that person. You know what I'm trying to say? Speaking the language, that's like a really important thing. People know if you're talking shit or if you're being false. So you wanna be able to speak in their tone and their style so you can resonate with that target audience. So for younger viewers that might be using the slang that's of the market like Riz and Aura and all that kind of stuff that works for a younger audience. Well, as a professional audience, you could use more industry specific terminology. So let's say for example, if I run a business to business content marketing company, I can use terms like CPMs or lead magnets or whatever because they'll understand what I'm trying to say and actually actually shows them that I know what I'm talking about. You want to align with values. So you want to create content that aligns with the core values and beliefs of your audience. If you're making content for football fans that like to get drunk and they like to play soccer and all this kind of stuff and you talk about why alcohol is bad for you, like there's no, you're not aligning with the value of the audience. You know, you're not, it's a bad example, but you have to be, someone who understands what your audiences actually believe, their core value, their core beliefs. And a big thing is also is to engage with your audience. These are people that are gonna become a part of your community. You wanna to talk to them, get feedback. Ask them about what they think, what's their, what, what problems they're dealing with. You know, have a community. You know, actually like people have, people have made community so transactionalized and they should be like, yeah, I'm here for you. And you're here for the content. And if you have questions, ask them. We will so, we'll, we'll actually engage with you and get back to you if you have any questions or problems that you're dealing with. And a big thing that I learned from doing product management and building tech products is how you build an audience. So you build something called user personas, right? A user persona is like the ideal person who'd be using this application. Like, and you create something about their life and what they do and who they are and what they do for work and all this stuff right there. But the best thing that you can do is build an audience persona for your content. So you can plan the best content that you can for this specific audience. And nobody does this in the space. This is the one of the biggest secrets for YouTube automation that nobody does. This is why this is not luck. And instead, actually, it is structured. Because if you understand what they want, then it's very hard to not get views because people are already asking these questions. You just have to solve for them. So example of building a, a audience persona is you gather audience data. So demographic, psychographic data that you've collected so you understand your audience. You wanna create a persona of this audience. So let's say for example, your channel, it says here two or three, but let's say your channel starts off and you have one, uh, one, like one niche, one segment, and you create one persona for this, for this, for this uh, channel. You wanna include key information in this persona. So like things like their name, their age, occupation, interests, pain points, goals, content habits, preferred platforms, and you, and you wanna go really deep to understand them. 
and you want to be very, very specific. And I'll give you an example on the next slide, so we don't have to worry. I will show you exactly what I'm talking about. But you want to add specific details, even add a stock photo of someone to envision that person. So you think about that person when you're creating the content. When Amazon was being built by Jeff Bezos, he created, he added an extra chair there for the customer. The customer was the additional person in every meeting because you want to think about that person. Same thing with your YouTube channels. You want to think about the audience persona that you're building, um, the audience that you're building this content for. And so when you do the content planning, you want to use this um, these personas, audience, audience personas to really go deep in what they are looking for, what they want, their problems, what they do to enjoy their time, where they find, you know, uh, how they find themselves spending their time online. And here's an example. An example of this is Alex. She is a marketing manager. She makes 65,000. She's from Chicago. Her, that's her demographics. Her interests are she enjoys digital marketing, productivity, and fitness. Her point, pain points are she struggles with work-life balance and wants to advance her career. Her goal is to improve marketing skills and start a side business. And she watches YouTube during lunch breaks and in the evening, prefers YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. This is what an example persona looks like for an audience, for a viewer. But I would add one more thing. So I'd add a photo of her so we know who we're talking about in this video, or sorry, in this persona. And so here's the conclusion for audiences. Audience understanding is key. You need to know your audience's demographics. I, I care the stuff about them, like their age, their income, all this kind of stuff. Their psychographics, their pain points, their problems they're dealing with. And you want to know what their content preferences are so you can create the best YouTube content for them. You can use tools to get insights about your audience and get direct feedback from your audience by engaging with comments and talking to your, talking to your people. You want to create a tailored content plan. So use this data to develop content that aligns with your viewers' pain points, interests, and preferences. You want to build a loyal community by understanding and engaging with your audience. You can foster a dedicated community around your YouTube channel. So important. Community is everything now. And to achieve greater success, effective audiences, audience targeting leads to higher engagement, retention, growth, and is actually one of the biggest indicators for success in YouTube automation. Sorry, guys. That's my dog. That's 2.2. I'll see you guys in 2.3. Thank you guys for watching. Hey, guys. Welcome back to module 2.3. Now, we're gonna be talking about something that is super, super important. That is channel positioning on YouTube. So how do you stand out while building a successful YouTube automation channel when it's competitive? So we're gonna be talking about a couple of things. We're gonna be talking about why YouTube is competitive. Well, one, it's, there's an easier barrier to entry and a lot of people need to work harder to stand out. Number two, we're gonna be talking about the importance of channel positioning. And that is a strategic process that defines how your channel is seen by your audience in relation to your competitors. And number third thing, we're going to be talking about how effective channel positioning is crucial for success on YouTube because it lets you build the right viewers and you can build a loyal following. Now, channel positioning is what sets Mr. Beast apart from other people. It's what sets these, these, these huge content creators apart from everybody else who's just trying to be them. Can't you say, you've heard a lot of people say, oh, he's just trying to be the next X or the next Y or the next this or the next that because the person who solidified the channel's positioning as the dominant person in that market, that niche, that, that, for that audience is the one that everybody's going to be comparing them to. So how do you define your channel's value proposition? Your value proposition is what is your channel, what is your channel even here for? What, is it, what does it actually do for the people that are watching your content? So we've talked about identifying your target audience in previous uh, modules, right? So you've got to understand who you're creating content for, their needs, their interests, their pain points. That, there's non-negotiable. You need to, if I come to you and ask you about your channel, and I ask you, who's your channel actually for? Like, wh who's watching these videos? Like, what's, what's, who? if you don't tell me exactly who the your audience is, then you don't understand your audience. The second thing is, even when brands come to you and they want to do affiliate marketing, so not affiliate marketing, they want to do a brand deal with you, and they ask you, so who's your audience? And you don't know how to answer that question. You look like a, you look like an idiot. So you need to know your audience. You need to know who's watching your content. Now, the next thing is you want to just define what, like clearly the type of content you provide and how it addresses your audience's requirements. So if I am here, obviously creating content for people that are 25 to 35 year old MMA enthusiasts who enjoy watching MMA on the weekend, they, they you know, and I want to create content for them. I have to be really clearly showing them what, what I'm offering them, right? I'm gonna offer you the most entertaining MMA content that is not seen on YouTube. 
You want to be a market of one. You don't want to be the same as somebody else. You, you want to be a, a distinguishable. I can only see this kind of content on your channel. A good example of this is Vote Sport. You guys should look at Vote Sport as an example of them positioning so, themselves as the people that are in the forefront of MMA content for, for fighters that are unknown. They do a great job of YouTube. They, 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 they do an insane job with YouTube and understanding their audience and what they actually want to watch. I watch their content all the time because they know me. They know what I want to watch. They understand me. You want to be unique as well, right? Because if you're unique in the way you do things and the way you present or the way you bring information together or all that kind of stuff, or you have a specific knowledge, knowledge that people don't have, that makes you unique. Because if you sound the same as everybody else, there's no reason why people will come to you. And if, you un if, if your audience understands the clear benefit and the values of your channel, then they'll come back one after another, after another, after another. They'll all be hooked, right? If they come to your channel, they get no value from your channel. Good luck trying to get them to come watch another video ever again. If anything, YouTube will penalize you for it. Because they came to your channel, they watched your videos, and it wasn't for them. It didn't suit the demand, even though YouTube knows that they're an MMA fan. And you want to be, you want to be concise. You want to be so clear about what your, what, your, what your value proposition is. Easy to understand. These are all very strong business concepts too. Just by the way, YouTube automation is business. But this, these are very strong business concepts even if you weren't doing YouTube automation. These are so important to understand. So let's say for example, we have a cooking channel that offers quick, budget-friendly recipes for busy college students with a focus on nutritious ingredients and minimal cooking equipment. That is so specific of what they do. Their core value is so simple. If I'm a college student, I know I can watch this channel and get some quick budget. I've got no money. I can get some quick recipes that are nutritious and they don't need a lot of equipment because I don't have equipment. I'm a college student. Second one is tech review channels that do in-depth, unbiased reviews of smartphones, right? Maybe some channels have a, a bias and you're gonna be an unbiased one, for example. Let's just say. So how do you differentiate your channel from your competitors? One, you need content angle. So once again, you gotta find a specific perspective or an approach in your niche that people aren't doing. So for example, a fitness channel that's focusing exclusively on apartment friendly, no equipment workouts, that's unique. Secondly, a distinctive presentation style, for example, maybe you have a unique voice or a, or a way to that you look on camera or the way you do things on camera, for example. Once again, we are talking about automation, but this is just an example. You want to be humoristic, you want to be storytelling, or you want to be serious, or you want to be very like, you know, uh, emotion drawing, or, you know, there's always different ways that you could be very distinctive in your presentation style, be unique as well, but expertise and credibility. Now, if you're an expert, or you, or you know what you're talking about, let's say, for example, you've been doing e-commerce for 20 years, then it's very hard to, for people to be competing against you if they don't have the same experience. Content format of innovation. This one's a bit different. Because you really got to understand that there are, you know, there are a lot of people that have seen what recipes work for content, right? And, it, and becoming innovative with content is very difficult. I am not going to say that it's easy, but you can do it if you think, if you're creative and you can think of different ways to kind of show something or present something, then it might work for you. Maybe you want to be different from your competitors because you actually talk to your audience. You have a strong community, you engage, you're active in the community and you create content based on what they want to see. That's important. Production quality. Maybe you, you beat them on production. So you have the better editors, the better storytelling, the better you know, uh, style of like the way it's presented. The way, the way you produce your, produce your content is insane. And then you, if, you, if you're insane quality content, you can't be beaten regardless, right? Because insane quality and good scripts and all this kind of stuff all added together through time means through time you will destroy your competitors. And the last one is if you solve unaddressed problems. If there are problems in a niche where the audience needs are not being met and you create content to fill those gaps, then you're gonna stand out from your competitors because they're not doing that for your audience. So we're gonna talk about quickly branding. Branding is what people see. It's your, it's your shop front. It's, your, it's the visual stuff that people see. And people spend a lot of time on branding because it's important, right? But it's simple these days. It is very easy to create a brand when you have AI tools that can do it for you, right? So all you really need is a logo. So a logo is gonna be your profile picture on YouTube. It's gonna be what you're gonna put into your videos. It's gonna be what people know you by, your logo and the name, basically. The second thing you need is gonna be a channel banner. Channel banners are really the, when people click onto your channel and they see that thing in the background, 
You want to make it look nice. You want to be something that's clearly communicates what your channel is about. You know, if you want, you can include your social media handles or any taglines or your name or whatever it may be. If you want to, color palette, pick two or three colors that you think represent your brand the best. Topography, also pick one or two fonts that represent your brand the best. Topography is just the type, the letters and stuff, the, the way this, the words look. The visual style, so if you want to be, if you want to have a consistent way of doing your thumbnails, I agree, you should. Keep doing them the similar way so people can build an association with a thumbnail that then they know it's you. Channel trailer, these are really important. When people come to your channel, what's your channel even about? What are they clicking here for? What are they what, what are they what are they in for? Maybe they watched the video, they liked your channel, they clicked it, they watch a trailer, and they go, okay, so this is what this channel is about. This is a channel for me. Custom thumbnails. Obviously, being it's very important that you create a custom thumbnail, that you don't use other people's stuff, that you're unique, right? Like you have a specific way of doing your thumbnails. And why is it important to be consistent in branding? Well, once again, we spoke about this. People are going to look at you and they're going to have a recognition. So they're going to have an association with the way you do things that they know it's you. The second thing is professional appearance. You want to look professional for brands. They want to come and give you money so you can make more money. The third thing is audience expectations, right? If you, if you, give, if you do really low quality stuff and you're not consistent in your branding and you go from all of a sudden doing really good content to doing really shit stuff, then bro, like the audience is going to be like, what's happening here? This sucks. And the number four thing is obviously algorithm favorability. They all, like, this is not guaranteed, but I think it is true that YouTube will prefer the more professional looking stuff, the better quality looking stuff. And it's, it, it makes sense because they want the platform to keep growing and they want people to watch and they want advertisers and all this kind of stuff. So it makes sense, right? And so how do you maintain consistency, which is a really important question. Thumbnails, use consistent layouts, fonts, schemes, colors, all that kind of stuff. Same, even the same five or six photos of you, you can take them one time and use them over and over again. Video intro and outro is not a must. I like outros, you don't need intros. I don't know, intros have changed a lot. So a lot of people still do intros, so that's up to you if you wanna do that. On-screen graphics. Once again, on-screen graphics is just if you, if you have a consistent way of doing things, like you have a way of like, if someone pops up on the screen, or something pops up on the screen, the way you, you, you label it, or the way you talk about things, if it's consistent, that's what, that's what makes sense. The main thing though, with consistency, is posting schedule. If you say you're gonna post three times a week, you fucking post three times a week. No, no, non-negotiable, you have to, right? Next thing, video structure. You gotta follow a consistent video structure, for example. Let's say I like the, I like the hook, uh, Alexis Homozi has this one as well. The hook, reward, retain. I think that's how he does it, right? You get them in, you give them so much value so they stay in the video, right? And then, oh, sorry, CTA. So you get them to do the next thing. So you go to another video or do this or do that, for example. Like like or subscribe as an example. But you, you, you hook them in with something like a question. And we'll talk about hooks through the course. You hook them in, you get them in the door, then you go to them. Okay, so now you're here. This is all the stuff that we're going to, like this is the, all this retention. Value, 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 value. And they stay for the whole video. And at the end, you get them to do something. So if you want them to watch something else, you, you say, you want them to like the video, you ask them. You want them to subscribe, you ask them. That's it. Tone and communication. If you like, if you go from one video talking like, hey, blah, 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 and the next video, like, hey, like, people don't even, they, they, they can't even come, like, they can't even understand what's happening. So you want to make it as easy for your audience to be like, okay, this doesn't seem weird to me. Because if something seems weird to someone, they won't watch. They'll just jump off. So you want to be consistent with your voice, personality, across your videos, your descriptions, your community, because you are an automated channel. You have YouTube automation. You don't have a personal brand. You don't have someone who's behind this. You have to be consistent with the way you say things and the way you communicate. And if you go into other platforms, keep the same imagery, keep the same branding across all, all platforms. And so to conclude, we have learned a lot of things today in this, in this module. The unique channel identity, so how do you create a distinct brand and persona that resonates with your target audience? How do you find your value proposition for your channel? How do you differentiate your content from other people? And how to have consistent branding with your video? I congratulate you for making it all the way through module two. And now we're gonna be moving to module three, which is exactly what you need. It is gonna be the content. How do you find good content? What makes good content? We're gonna talk about how to do a content, content plan so you can plan in advance and a lot of special stuff in that one. You're gonna love it. Module three is gonna be super important in your automation journey with YouTube. Welcome to module 3.1. In this module, we're gonna be talking about developing a content strategy for YouTube automation. If you've made it this far, once again, I wanna say congratulations because you are on the journey 
to getting ready to start your own YouTube automation business. And I respect you for making it this far. In this one, we've got, we got four modules for um, module three, you know, four, uh, four sections, sorry. And we're going to be talking all about content. And so in the first one, we're going to be talking about how do you develop a content strategy for YouTube automation? And so we're going to be introducing a few, a few topics today. We're going to be talking about the importance of content strategy because a well-planned content strategy is crucial to succeed with YouTube automation. Secondly, when you align with audience interests, you are able to develop a content strategy that ensures your content is going to work, is going to get views, is going to really suit what your audience wants and supports your channel's goal, which is to grow and make more money. Number three, when you optimize your content strategy for your audience, and all these things happen in alignment. Not only do you have you, your audience enjoys your content, but YouTube will recommend it to more people, including the, to people that haven't seen you yet. So it's going to optimize you for visibility, right? So it's YouTube is a search engine, and so when you do the right things by your audience, they engage, they like your content. What's going to happen? More people are going to find out about your content. You're going to get recommended to more people, and that grows your channel and it allows you to grow your business, make more money from YouTube. So what is a content calendar? I'm gonna make it really simple. This is There's a lot of stuff here that we'll go through, but what basically content calendar is, is that you plan 50 to 100 pieces of content that you're going to make. You have to get the titles ready to go. And you're gonna be planning in advance. So it lets you understand, okay, so this is the content that we're making. It lets you prepare, it lets you plan, and it lets you, you kind of think about the content that you're making and to make sure that it actually falls within what is right for your audience. Now, there are a lot of tools that we could talk about, but I'm gonna give you the way to do it for free, all right? So first things first, when you're creating a content calendar, you have to choose a tool. Don't worry about all the paid stuff. There's a lot of paid stuff that you can use. I just use Google Sheets. It's for free and it's good and it does everything that you need it to do. Because you can just put the titles, you can say when it's gonna come out, when it's due, all these things. Has it been has it been done yet? Has, has it gone to the editor? All these tabs you could put in there in Google Sheets. The second part is you want to define the time frame, define the time frames. So let's say, for example, you plan 100 pieces of content. That that for you could be a year's worth of content, or it could be six months worth of content. It just depends on how much content you're willing to push. Second thing is, third thing, sorry, is when are these pieces of content need, need to be ready, when they need to be launched. And if there's anything that's happening, so like, for example, if you're doing a launch for your product, let's say you have a product that you want to sell to your audience, or you have an event or a holiday or something that's happening within your ecosystem that you want to be ready for, you want to identify these key events so you know, right? The biggest thing is to establish content categories as well. So like you, you want to be able to say, this is for this person, this is for that person, one. You also want to be able to say what it's what it's there for, what is it going to do? Is it top? Is it going to be like something that's going to be evergreen content? Is it going to be trending content? Is it going to be shot this way? How long is it going to be? There's going to be so many categories, but that's all personal. What I like to do is I just have a couple of categories where I'm like, okay, so this is the piece of content, a little bit of a description about what it's going to be about. When is it going to be launched? Hopefully, when the, has the editor received it? Has it been has a thumbnail been created? Just little things like that that let you pr produce it better. Mentally, you need to set a publishing frequency so you know how long each piece, of, like how long your content bank is going to last you. Because your content calendar is just going to be from this point until the end of the year, basically. This is all the content you have. So what you could do is you could work backwards and go, okay, so we're going to be releasing content all these days. So I have to get everything aligned for these days and the best thing as well is to always plan brainstorm add more maybe new ideas will come that are better than the ones that you have and so you bring those ones up for example and 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 you're able to then really be tr like really be relevant to your audience and you're able to establish that connection with your audience and they're going to really respect you because you're going to have the content that they want when they want it let's say for example you're in an ecosystem and something happens right and you have all this other content planned Make that content a priority if you know that your audience is actually actively looking for this content. I, saw, I spoke about this before, really important production milestones. You need to be able to say, where is it in the development process? Is your video in the scripting process, is it in the filming, is it in the editing, whatever it may be. You need to be able to know where it is at in your video, in your, in your, uh, in your calendar, so you know exactly where you need to be, when you need to be there. Once again, we talked about being flexible when new content comes in. 
And the biggest thing is to adjust. So do weekly adjustments or monthly adjustments or whatever you need to make sure that your content calendar is up to date and, and, and good as possible. Because that if that exists, then you've got everything else solved. Because once you know when the content is gonna needs to be done, when it needs to be filmed, when it needs to be scripted, it becomes a machine. A machine you just add ideas to, and then certain people know when to start. This person gets the uh, gets the notification to do their stuff. Boom, boom, boom. It's a well oiled machine. A good question I get asked: What's the difference between evergreen content and trending content? So evergreen content is something that's relevant and valuable over a long period of time, and there's steady traffic that comes from that. It builds channel authority. And it, and it can be repurposed or updated easily. So let's say, for example, documentaries or how to do something, for example, or education or whatever it may be. Here are some of them. They're, they're, they're concepts, how-to videos, explanations, and timeless advice. Trending content is something that's happening right now. Popular topics, trends that are happening right now, which can lead to rapid growth, right? Because you're being very relevant. Right, and it engages audiences with current topics. So an example is like news, reaction, viral content, whatever it may be, a trend, for example. When people ask me what the percentage should be between evergreen content and trendy content, it depends on your channel. I like to go for a 70-30 balance, but you could do whatever you like. You could do 110, or 100-0. You could do just trending content. You could just do evergreen content. That has to be a personal decision you make. So here are some strategies that I look, like to look at for content. So once again, 70-30 rule. 70% evergreen, 30% trending is what I usually do, but you can do something different. Content parry. So you can create trending content that is in relation with evergreen topics. So evergreen topics could be like, I teach you how to do something with YouTube, but then something could pop up where it's like, this AI tool is gonna to be really interesting because it just came out and it could really help your YouTube channel. That's an example. Trend adaption, adaptation, sorry. So you wanna find ways to relate trends to your niches. So for example, if you find a trend that's happening in your ecosystem and everyone, like let's say even a shoulder niche that does like, let's say someone does Facebook, you do YouTube ads as an example, and you find something that they've done that's that's gone viral and it's really trendy in their ecosystem, you could bring that to your thing. You could talk about it with your thing. Seasonal planning. Once again, you want to be ready. So if there's stuff that's happening that you know happens every year in your ecosystem or stuff that happens that you want to be at the forefront of, and you want to prepare, prepare evergreen content because you know people are always searching for this stuff, then you want to be ready. You always want to also be ahead of all the trends. So there are a lot of trends like Google Trends or TrueBuddy and all these kind of stuff that can help you find topics that are rising in your niche, right? And I always believe that it's good to have a solid base of evergreen content before going into trends, even if even if you want to do a trend phase channel, that's that's fine. But I always have an evergreen basis just because it's going to be long term. People are going to keep coming in through the door. So it's important to set some goals for content. So why do I think the goals are really important? Is because they set milestones that when you when you hit them, you can celebrate, you can enjoy, and you could be like, wow, like I did this during this time. So stuff could be like view goals. Engagement goals, subscriber goals, monetization goals, community goals, SEO goals. I've listed a couple of goal examples here that you can go through and look at. But it's really important to have them be personal to you, what you want to do, how you want to achieve it, what you want out of your channel. And if your goal is to hit 10,000 views within the first seven videos or 10,000 views within the first 50 videos, then that's a good goal to have that you can work towards every single day. Because what you can do is you can work backwards to identify what the, tra what the thing you want to do is and the steps it's gonna to take to get to that point. We talked about consistent, consistency before, but why is frequency and consistency so important? There's five reasons. We've got audience expectations. So regular posting helps build habits for your viewers. That is so true. Like if I've grown accustomed to watching your channel every Tuesday and I wait for your content every single Tuesday, then I'm ready and I'm here for it. Also, YouTube tends to, tends to favor channels that are consistently uploading it because they are having more chances to hit right? Maybe there's a better chance for them to go viral. They, if you have more swings, you're going to hit the ball more often. Also, discipline. This is more of a mental thing, right? When you're consistently posting, you're disciplined. You're being very productive in your content creation journey. The next thing is uh, analytics is, are more accurate, right? When you're producing more content, you're able to see monthly, weekly, every couple of months, it's better data because you know what's worked, what hasn't worked, and you can focus on the things and double down on the things that have worked for you. And once again, 
It goes with that being said, if you're consistent, you're frequent, you're able to grow your audience faster because once again, you have more swings. You have more chances to hit a viral video and do well and get a lot more views and a lot more audience uh, uh, and your audience to build. Here are some popular content types and formats. I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'm sure you guys already know some of these. Tutorials, lists, for example. I want you to think about how you can find content types and formats for yourself, right? Think about the content types and formats that would work for your niche, your audience, right? And do that for them. And you can try a whole bunch of different things. You can try a variety of these different things and see what works for you. And so in conclusion for module 3.1, Content strategy is essential for long-term success with YouTube automation because when you have a detailed content calendar, you're balancing content, you're really aligning with the viewer, you're setting clear goals, and you're being consistent. You can It becomes a machine and a framework that you can follow. And that's the most important thing with YouTube. If I could tell you one thing that made me succeed in YouTube, it wasn't that I went viral. It wasn't that I did this or did that. It was that I was consistent. Right, consistency is king in everything that you do in life, be that weight loss journey, whatever journey you're on. If you're consistent, you can do it for longer than anybody else can. Entrepreneurship, whatever it may be, it's very hard to lose. Thank you guys for watching 3.1. We're going to move on to 3.2. What makes good content? Thank you guys for making it to module 3.2. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the foundations of good content on YouTube. Now, we're not going to go super in depth because it's gonna be very super, like it's gonna be very top of mind things that make good content on YouTube. This is not for you to memorize. This is for you to think about and have a th framework in your brain to think about the content that you do and if it facilitates what I'm about to say. Now the importance of good content, once again, is the foundation of success for YouTube, right? Good content equals better success on YouTube and especially for YouTube automation. There's not one size that fits all. Every video, every channel has a different way of creating value and becoming good content. Or, you know, and so you want to be, once again, this is a framework for mentality, not just the thing that you follow exactly word for word. And we're going to discuss all the key elements that actually go into making a good video. So these are the things that make good content. Relevance, value, authentic, consistent, and viewer retention. Relevant, it just addresses what your audience wants, their needs, right? Value is that it actually offers clear value, whether that be educational, entertainment, or inspirational value in every video. Authentic is that you build, try to build a genuine connection and trust with your audience, long-term loyalty. Consistent, once again, we're talking about consistency a lot right now. And it's about maintaining a regular schedule and consistent quality to build a recognizable brand. And the last one is viewer retention. It's how do you keep someone when, who clicks on your video to watch as much as they can? So how do you address your audience's needs? Relevance, right? We've talked about audience personas before, and I feel like we talk about them a lot, but they are so, so important. They can't be neglected, right? You need, you need to understand who's watching your content. You want to un understand the analytics of your channel. What's happening? Look at the data. See what it says, right? What's actually resonated with your audience? Now, not just that. You want to also engage with your audience. You want to talk to them. You want to build a connection with them. You want to ask them. Maybe they'll tell you what they want, what's relevant to them as well. You want to solve problems, right? If your audience are dealing with problems, say you're in a market that needs educational help and they're dealing with problems, then you can address common challenges or questions that your audience faces and help them solve their problems. You want to stay current. You want to keep up the trends and news in your niches because they'll give you fast growth, but it'll also make you look like you're someone who's up to date with the topics or the niches that you're in. Imagine being too late, two years late to a party. That sucks. Nobody wants that. You want to respond to feedback. Create content based on what your audience wants. They will tell you what they want. And so you can create content that will make sure that they will click and watch it. And also, if anything in your niche revolves around uh, a season or a holiday or an event, then you want to be also ready for that. You want to be relevant as well. And we've already spoken about these ones as well. But understanding your audience, you can also do other things to understand your audience apart from the three, the three at the top. You can do surveys. You could do search trends that you can understand. And once again, just align your content with your audience. How do you create relevant content? Well, Look at it like this. If they have problems that need to be solved, you solve them. That's relevant. If they have something that's happening in the niche that you're in and you talk about that problem, like the thing that's happening in the niche, that's relevant. That works. You know, if they ask you for, for specific content and people are engaging with that and they want that content and you do it, that's also creating relevant content. You know what I'm trying to say? It's not difficult. It's not, it's not rocket science, right? If your audience tells you what you want, make content for them. If they have problems, solve their problems. If you want to, if you, if you, if something happens in that market that you're in and you don't talk about it, how are you being current? You're not being relevant. That's, that's, it's so, it's just, it's so simple. 
The next thing is value in, value in YouTube content. So there's four ways that you can see value and every YouTube video has one of these four or a subcategory of these four. You've got educational value, which is teaching skills, providing information, explaining concepts to your audience. You've got entertainment value, which is amusing, exciting, emotionally engaging your audience through creative content that's fun and engaging. You've got inspirational value, which is to motivate viewers and get them to be aspirational. It's aspirational content that gets them to do something, get up and work or do something like build something for yourself or a dream. And there's practical value, which is like you offer actionable advice for real for solutions or solutions to real world problems that your audience faces. And by doing a mixture of these ones, maybe you can you can take some of these ones, like you can do entertainment and education. You can, your video needs to have at least one of these four. And this is how you and this is how you deliver the value. You be specific, you go in depth, you be you have a unique perspective, and you maintain high production quality. Those things are so important, right? You want to offer concrete, actionable information that you can your viewers don't just skim over the surface, but they actually get to go dive, they get they, they get to dive deep into these topics with you. And going in depth is like not just a really short video on how to do something, actually go and and, and help them, right? How do you make authentic content? With YouTube automation, it's difficult because there's no personal brand that's attached to it. But if you have if you have a YouTube or like a channel that does doing YouTube automation, you want to have a genuine personality. You want to let your real personality shine through the, with the how you engage with people, how you reply to comments, how you, how you do your community stuff. They will show you your personality through that way. You want to be transparent. You don't want to be fake, right? You want to be consistent. Once again, consistency is the king, right, of everything. You want to be consistent with your brand voice, your values, and the things that you believe. And you want to be relatable, right? If people can come to you and they relate with your channel, then they're going to become a part of your audience. They're going to become a loyal um, a member of your audience. And here are some areas of consistency. We've discussed a lot of these before, so we'll go through quickly. Schedule of posting, the quality of content needs to be consistent. Each video needs to be very high quality content and has to be consistent. Visual branding, your logos, your thumbnails, your colors, your graphics, everything needs to be consistent. And the way you say things, the way you respond to people, and the way your brand looks in the limelight has to be consistent. It is non-negotiable. And the last one that's really important, I think, is viewer retention, which is keeping your audience engaged, right? So how do the people do this? And we're going to go deeper into this whole topic in another module, right? But strong openings, which are the hook. You want clear structure, which basically it's it's like you people know what's going to happen kind of as they go through the video. They can follow it. It's, a, it's clear. It's not difficult to follow. There's, there's something that's interesting to them visually, like there's B-roll, graphics, animations, all that just to get them, get the brain working a little bit and go, oh, wow, what's happening? The pacing, you have to have a good rhythm. You gotta balance information with moments of high energy to just keep people going up and down. We'll talk about these anyway. And the most important thing to keep people engaged is storytelling, right? Use narrative techniques to create a sense of progression and keep viewers curious about what is coming next. And to conclude, creating high quality content on YouTube for YouTube automation focuses on content that resonates with the audience and performs well on the platform. And how do you do that? By being relevant, by creating value, by being authentic, being consistent, and, and prioritizing viewer retention. That is module 3.2. I hope you guys learned something from this module. I'll see you guys in 3.3. Welcome back to 3.3. In this one, we're gonna be talking about actually how do you mine for ideas using stuff like YouTube and other platforms that can basically help you identify content ideas that people already are searching for so you can have the, some that you can add to your list of content ideas that you can film videos for. An example of this is with YouTube search. YouTube search suggestions are a gold mine when it comes to finding ideas and content people are actively searching for. So what you could do, for example, is like, let's say we're taking YouTube automation as the example. You could do YouTube automation and then it'll auto suggest ideas people want. So you can find ideas like that. You can group some ideas together for one video that solves multiple things. You can also do stuff like added modifiers to it. How to, why, best, versus. You use these keywords to uncover different types of content people are searching for. You can add letters to it. So you can do YouTube automation A and see what comes up. YouTube automation B, C, and it'll give you long tail variations of topics people are searching for on YouTube. 
Because by checking for user intent, you can pay attention to these questions and queries and phrases that people are searching, and that you can use this to make helpful video ideas. Mine the YouTube search bar. It is literally a gold mine. So advanced techniques, we've already discussed these ones in the things before. Modifiers, add letters. Some good ways to also find some ideas are some tools. So you got stuff like TrueBuddy. TrueBuddy is a paid tool. I think there's a free version, I'm not too sure, but it helps you look at search volume and data um, for, for YouTube search terms, which is really helpful as you build your channel. Competitor analysis. We've definitely discussed competitor analysis before, but we'll go into it again. So by identifying the top channels in your niche, you can see what are the five to 10 most successful channels in your niche. You can actually go and find the most popular videos. And it's actually best to do it in the last year because it proves that there's demand for it. Look at their recent uploads. See what they're talking about now, the current, current, current content trends in your niche. Maybe they'll give you an idea of where to start, right? Look at their playlists, right? You can get an idea of how they're categorizing and how they're structuring content so you could do it for yourself as well, right? And understand the key metrics and consider the key metrics because if you analyze metrics like their view count, their like to view ratio, their common engagement, you can understand what content is performing well. Once again, giving you ideas and tools and techniques to help you find pieces of content to do for your channel. These are key metrics that I love. View count, like to view ratio, common engagement, video titles and thumbnails, right? So what has worked before will work again for video titles and thumbnails. If there's more engagement, that means that the video did really well, but are they missing something that you can address? Like to view ratio. If there's a lot of likes, then it means there's a positive sentiment towards the video. If there's a lot of views, but not a lot of likes, it might have not hit the ball, but people are searching for it. And the view count means that there's a lot of popularity, popularity if a lot of people are searching for this content or they're watching this content actually even. Another platform, Social Blade. I love, I love Social Blade. I'm, I'm a stalker on Social Blade. I like to look at other people in my niche, how many views they're getting per day, how, how they're doing, because they can tell me how much money they're making, how much they're doing, all that kind of stuff. And it's insane, right? Google Trends is another big one, right? With Google Trends, you can see data over time on YouTube to see how something's going over time. Does it grow up or is it going down in 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 like uh, interest and popularity. Because if it's going up, it might be it might be something that's gonna be going up for, for a very long time and you can capitalize on it. But if it's going down through time, maybe it's a bit harder to do that. And you can compare multiple terms. So you can see which topics or, or stuff that you, you wanna do to see if there's potential there to make videos, right? And then you've got geographic data, right? So with geographic data, Google Trends allows you to get insights to the geographic distribution of where this stuff is performing better. So what you can do is you can basically go to these places and go, you can make very, very uh, location specific content. And the big one, which obviously it didn't, I, I made a mistake here in the PowerPoint because it hasn't got anything there, but related queries. So if I search up something like YouTube automation and it gives me something like faceless channels, that's very similar. So I can use that as a related query because like, okay, that's similar to what I'm trying to do. And they'll give you ideas for create queries that people are already searching. It's a powerful tool. Don't neglect Google Trends, even don't neglect Google search data. And here's an example of how to do it, right? Compare multiple terms. So look at this term versus this term on YouTube to see what's doing better. Explore related queries, see what's similar to what people are searching for. So you know what your audience is engaging with a topic and what they want from that topic. And you can leverage geographic data by knowing that this content works well in this place. You can actually work, it can work in your favor by really going for those people. As to the public, these are some paid tools that can help you look at stuff like As to the Public, Basumo. They're expensive, but they have a free version, I think, that you can use and they can give you an understanding of what people are searching for in a topic or content idea that you're putting up. If you put a search query up, they'll give you a whole bunch of information for that for that search query, for example. We talked about Basumo just before. It's a content aggregating platform that lets you see what's trending, what's doing really well right now. And here's some insights for Basumo. If you do want to use it, it is a bit expensive. So I'm gonna just have this here for you if you wanna read it, but because a lot of people can't afford Basuma, I'm not gonna go deeper into it. And to conclude, right, conclusion, use multiple sources, can combine insights from various tools and platforms for very, very well-rounded content strategies. Stay current, regularly use these techniques to stay updated on trends and audience interests. Analyze patterns, look for themes or questions across different platforms so you can answer them through the videos. Balance trends and evergreen content. 
Mix trending topics with consistently popular subjects for sustainable content strategy. And the last one is adapt and personalize. Use these ideas as inspiration, but always adapt them to fit your unique style and audience. Thank you guys for watching 3.3. I look forward to seeing you guys in 3.4. Welcome to module 3.4. Now this is gonna be a very intensive module because we're gonna be going through advanced script writing for maximum YouTube retention. Now, you've learned what, what a good content idea is. You learn how to find content. You learn how to do all that kind of stuff now. This is the part where you actually create the script for the content. Now, this is gonna be challenging and I wanna, I want to say that up front because I still find this challenging to this day to write the best scripts that I can, right? So this is going to be, uh, uh, we're going to try to do this and I'll give you guys the best advice that I can. We're not going to go in depth into everything during this module because it's just impossible to do all of script writing in one module. But um, I'll try to do the best to give you guys the concepts that you'll need to succeed with script writing with YouTube automation. If anything, if you understand these concepts, you're able to figure out what makes a good script or a bad script. And then you're able to, when you work with people, or you use ChatGPT or Claude to generate your scripts for you, you can see and go, okay, so this is what's a good script. This is what a bad script looks like. Yeah. All right. So why is a script important? Well, in the science of attention, understanding YouTube attention is, YouTube attention is super important. YouTube retention is directly connected to being favored by the algorithm. How often your videos get shown when people search a, a search something. How much money you make. Subscribers, because if you have people that watch more, they're more likely to subscribe. They also lead to things like, you know, uh, more impressions, more shares, more. Retention is the factor of YouTube that is unbelievably important, right? And there are a couple of patterns that you can look out for and we'll discuss them through this, uh, through this module. So the key retention that matters, you've got the audience retention graph, retention, you've got the average percentage viewed and the average view duration. So the audience retention graph is, as you see visually, it's how much of your video the average viewer watched. So you can identify at what point something is happening. Like if there's a drop for the beginning, it might be your hook. If there's something at the middle, it might be uh, something with your mid retention that sucks. Like your value is not that good enough, right? But every, like there's no YouTube video that stays like this the whole time. Everyone dips down before the end because it's just normal, right? But if we can get them to like watching, getting uh, uh, higher, watching higher, more of the video, then it's better for us, right? The average percentage viewed means if you take all the viewers of a video, what is the percentage average between everyone that watched the video? And it's a very clear indicator of viewer engagement. So if they watch 23%, that's not that good. But if they watch 50%, that's amazing, for example. And the average view duration is how much time the average person spends on your video. So like 20 seconds, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, whatever it may be. These are the three retention patterns that you need to be very aware of. You got the first 15 seconds, which is really crucial. You have to hook them in, right? You got the 50 second, 50% 50 drop off, which is during the middle. A lot of viewers tend to leave before the halfway point. So you gotta find ways to keep them engaged even up until the midpoint. And then you got the end screen retention. So towards the end, there's a slight uptick in retention towards the last 20 seconds of your viewers because some people might skip a lot of it and they get to the end only, for example. You do something like this and it goes like that. Happens all the time. Right, and this is where you can use the last 20 seconds to do a call to action. So how do you craft the perfect hook, right? The first, first 15 seconds of the video are so critical, right? If you they click on your thing, because you might have a good thumbnail, good the headline, but if the hook doesn't answer what the video is about, or doesn't get them to think about the video and make it irresistible not to watch, then they're not gonna watch, right? So how do you do really good openings, really good hooks? Curiosity, so tease information without revealing it, right? You wanna create intrigue so they want to watch the video. Bold statements, so make controversial or surprising claims that need an explanation, it gets the viewer's attention. Time-based hooks, right? You can frame your content within a specific time frame so that they have to watch it and they have to act quickly, right? The story tease, you can start off with the most exciting part of the story and then promise to reveal how it happened and that's a big one that a lot of these storytelling ones do, right? And you've got the problem solution opening. So if you have a problem, this is gonna be the solution and this is how we're gonna do it. Super, super easy. These are the ones that work the best, right? And if you wanna optimize your hook, you wanna be specific, use numbers and timeframes. 
If you want to use, if you want to optimize your hook, use pattern interrupts. So something in, unexpected element to grab someone's attention. That's a hook. That's that's a pattern interrupt, for example, right? You want to create visual interest. Maybe you put something up here, or you flash something there, you do something in the in the video to get them to go, oh, what the hell just happened? And then you want to speak directly to the viewer. You, I'm talking to you. Me and you are having this conversation. You're like, oh, oh wow, I can feel connected, right? Now, how do you structure your content for maximum engagement, right? This is called the curve method that I use a lot. So you want to see is curiosity. You want to continuously tease upcoming information to maintain the viewer's interest. U is urgency. So you want to create time pressure to drive engagement, right? This is something that's only going to be available for like the next two weeks. You want to take advantage of this situation, for example. Relevancy. You want to ensure that every point relates directly to the viewer's interests or needs. Value. Pack your content with insights and information and value that people want to watch, right? Or entertainment. So you infuse a script with elements that entertain as well as inform. You can only you know you only have to pick one of these ones to do really well with script writing on YouTube automation. These are some pacing techniques. We're not going to go super deep into pacing techniques because it really depends on what works for your channel. I like to use the roller coaster method where it goes up and down, up and down, high energy moments, lower energy moments, high energy moments, lower energy moments. What movies use, right? It's what movies do to keep you hooked the whole time, right? There's the mountain structure as well, where it's like you're building up to a climax. You've got the breadcrumb technique where you can go, oh, this is something happened, um, something happened in the front at the beginning, but then you work towards backwards towards it, for example. In a moment, I'll show you how you can do one thing that can increase views. You go, oh wow, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for that because I want to see that. And you got the timestamp strategy. So you can use timestamps to break the content into sections, and then you can mention these timestamps as well. So you can tell them, listen, like we've broken this down into sections. Like this video will be, this course will be broken down into sections. So people can just go, oh, okay, I can go to this part here to watch this stuff. So how do you maintain mid-video momentum? The mid-video drop-off is insane, right? So there's a couple of ways that you can keep them hooked. You could do a mid-video hook. So you introduce a new element or a new intrigue. So I'd like, this is where things really get interesting, as an example. The unexpected turn, like, oh, who, who would have thought that was going to happen, for example? Like a plot twist, you know? It's like, wow, I didn't expect it. Now you're hooked again, right? Or the quick recap and foreshadow. So you just summarize everything that's happened, and this is where the real stuff is going to happen right now. Just a couple of ways. There's always more. There's, this is not a, a full list of everything. There's a lot more always, right? Language is super powerful when it comes to script writing. Okay, so like the way you say things actually causes an increase in viewer engagement when used. So here are some numbers, for example. When you have something that's curiosity intriguing, right, it might increase about 22%. When you have something that's urgent, it might increase about 80, 18%. When you have value, it might increase about 15%, right? If you have something that's emotional, it might increase about 20% because they're dealing with the same emotional things that you're dealing with, for example. And here are a couple of ways that you can boost retention through video elements that you can include in your scripts. I'm not gonna go through all of them in depth, but some examples are like pet interrupts, which we've discussed, interactive elements, so uh, opportunities for people to like comment or leave um, their thoughts or like the video or something like that, for example. A part of your script that will be to try to get them to do something. B-roll footage, screen recording animations, visuals, whatever. Graphics, charts, diagrams, data visualizations, whatever it may be. And then strategically placing text overlays dis to display important information. Obviously, if someone's if someone's being something about someone is being said, you can use that to kind of give some context, right? And then you can also try like varied angles and movements and and like the way that you go from one scene to another scene also can get people very excited and keep people engaged with your content. But basically, this is the conclusion for script writing. There are so many ways to write scripts. Pick the one that works for you. You want to study retention. You want to know what's working for your videos, what's not working for your videos, and why it's not working or it is working. And if you have people leaving quickly, it could be because of your hook. If people stay after the hook and the script isn't engaging because you're not helping them, it's not through a journey or it's not it's not it's not, it's not written correctly, then they might leave midway through. So you've got to rehook them maybe. Always test different script techniques to see what works for you. Always prioritize genuine value and connection with your audience as always. You want to create an experience that people can't help but watch to completion because we don't have a retention problem. People watch movies that are three hours long or they binge series. We have we have a your video sucks problem. And that's module 3.4. I want to congratulate you guys for making it past module 3.4 and you have finally made it to module four, which is halfway through this entire course. So I want to say congratulations, well done. 
four is all about video optimization, right? Titles, tags, SEO, all that kind of stuff. I want to say congrats, well done, keep going with the way you're going and you're going to end up in a better place than where you were. Thank you. Welcome to module four. In this one, we're going to be talking about a few things, including video optimization, thumbnails, headlines, and SEO. This one's going to be about the basic and advanced video editing, right? Just for maximum engagement. I am not the best editor in the world, but I can give you the ideas and the concepts that you should know so that when you go and hire an editor or you want to edit yourself, you know what, what to look for, basically. So basically, editing is so crucial for YouTube. It's literally all of it, basically, right? Because you get all this stuff, you can have the best script, you can have all that kind of stuff, but if you can't put it together into a good video, then there's no point. That's how you create engaging content that gets people engaged and gets them actually watching your video and staying tuned to your video. So we're gonna talk about a couple of techniques that I know through time, from basic cuts to advanced storytelling things that you can do for video editing to maximize the main thing, which is viewer engagement. Because at the end of the day, with viewer engagement being higher, retention being higher, you get shown to more people, more people watch your content, you get more people that have become a part of your audience, subscribers and all that kind of stuff. And by definition, more subs, more views equals more retention, which equals more views, which equals more subs, which equals in the end, more money through YouTube automation. Let's talk about the introductory ways to look at video editing. We have trimming. So when I say trimming, I want you to know that trimming just means cutting out the unnecessary stuff, right? So you want to keep con you want to keep content concise and engaging. You don't want a whole bunch of like, um, yeah, um, yeah. You don't want that, right? So people use cutting to get rid of all those dead ends, dead space, right? You got text overlays. So when you use text overlays, you're adding context or emphasis or visual interesting visual interest or something for people to read or it's animated text, like subtitles as well. And it's best to do this in the lower thirds. And the reason we say lower thirds is because, right, you don't wanna be obscure, like you don't wanna get, you don't wanna hide what, what's happening in the actual video, but have it be an additional thing, right? To highlight key points and make sure that there's a good contrast. The contrast just means like, they're not the same color. Like if you're wearing a yellow shirt and using yellow subtitles, you're doing something stupid, right? And transitions. So transitions basically are just the flow between clips and scenes, clip A, clip B. Right, so you can do fades, you can do cuts, you can do you, it dissolves. There's a lot of things that uh, you can use for transitions, and there's like tools like CapCut, which have hundreds and hundreds of transitions that you can use um, to to get from one scene to the next scene. Um, and so, basically, with trimming, you can do cuts during movement to create seamless transactions. Uh, you can do one where the audio plays from another clip, well, footage from another clip plays over it. And you basically have to remove that space. That's the main foundation of trimming. Transitions, there, there's a couple of transitions. So you, there's a cut transition where you go from one clip to another, just go straight. Dissolve, so one fades into another one. Wipe, where it's like you're moving through it and you're using an effect to kind of get it from this to that. Or there's a one where you're fading, basically. Fade to a black screen or a white screen, for example. Usually at the beginning or usually at the end of the video. Here's examples of, uh, of text overlays. This is not a great example, obviously, this picture, so don't use this one. That's more just to add some, you know, that's for like shorts or for Instagram reels or whatever, but it's usually just done to add emphasis and key points and to create some visual interest. And when you use it effectively, it can be very good at effectively communicating information and guiding the audience through the content. There's some important things, that's, that's, that's basic editing. There's some intermediate editing stuff that also really uh, is important. So there's stuff like sound design. So you wanna make sure that the audio quality and there's a, uh, the mixture between voiceover, music, sound effects, all this kind of stuff don't clutter and don't make it sound terrible. You also wanna make sure that it looks nice, right? The color correction, grading techniques, the exposure, contrast, all these things, these are, these are all jargon, right? Just make it look nice and clean and professional doesn't have to be all this jargon. If you want to go deeper into this kind of stuff, you can always use stuff like ChatGPT and N and Claude to go deeper on what color grading is and how to do it effectively for videos. That's not the point of this course. The course is to teach you YouTube automation, so you should know about this, but it doesn't mean you have to be an expert at this, right? I'm not an expert at any of these things, but I understand them enough, right? Pacing, that's a big one, right? You want to control the rhythm of the video, the energy from shot to shot to shot to shot to allow for some high energy, some low energy. It's a it's a way of kind of making the story through the clips, right? And to keep it engaging. 
So here's some examples of sound design. So we got background music. So you got to choose music that fits the mood, right? If you're if you are talking about a sad thing and you're playing like I don't know, like some poppy song or whatever, it doesn't make sense. Sound effects. If you if you got a place where you could add sound effects and they're fun and they're exciting or they do something or they can, you know, it's like a clip or a bong or a beep or whatever it may be, then you can add sound effects too. But you want to make sure that it's balanced, right? So it's not over, none of these are overpowering each other. They all work in unison. And as long as people can hear what you're saying, that's the most important part. And the biggest thing is to remove background noise for for clarity, right? You want to have it be super clear and crisp. Color grading, like once again, I said I'm not an expert at this stuff. No, like very very few people are probably experts at this stuff. But the main thing is color correction. You want to adjust exposure to make it look nice. You want to add a look to your footage. Maybe you want to add, make it a little warmer or a little bit cooler or whatever, moody or, you know, maybe you have a scene where it looks different. You know, the main thing is to be consistent once you get consistency. If you're going to have a way that you want to do your, your color, make it sure that's the same for most videos if you can. Um, and you can use color to draw attention to specific elements in, the, in a picture. And here are some ways you can do pacing. So you can do different lengths of shots, B-roll footage, matching pace to the content and actually doing a build and release, build and release, up, down, up, down. The roller coaster method, kind of. So these are the super advanced techniques, right? So there's storytelling through editing. So you can create a, a compelling narrative using techniques by doing nonlinear editing, parallel editing, montages, for example, to present events out of chronological order and build tension. These three... To be honest, you don't really need to know how to do these things. I I added them here, so if you want to read and understand what they're about, you can, but they're not that important because advanced techniques, you don't really need to know that. As someone who does YouTube automation, you can, and you can understand these things to a high level so you can make better content. But when you're just starting off, this stuff is like long-term things that you didn't understand. And these are just going a little bit deeper into those kind of things. Um, here's a good one though. Here's a very good one. So this is someone who's going to be trying to pace for viewer retention. So we spoke about this, uh, the the like structure of scripts in the last video. And so basically, we're going to go deeper into this quickly now. So first 15 seconds, hook, right? Capture their attention immediately. Second part is promise and payoff. So ret value, retention, value, trying to keep them in the video for as long as they can. But occasionally, you want to break this pattern so that it doesn't feel like they're just becoming monotonous, right? It's just going through the video. Right, so you break the pattern to get this re-excitement, this re-engagement, so they want to watch a little bit longer, for example. And the biggest thing is also to use B-roll footage, visual stuff, for example, to keep people interested. Everyone likes stimulus. Everyone likes that. You know, something that's happening on the screen, I want to watch, I want to see what's happening, right? What are the editing tools that I recommend? Now, if you want to edit yourself, CapCut. If you want to hire someone, they can use Adobe Premiere Pro, right? This is, these are the pros and cons of each one. I, I would say as an audit, like someone does YouTube automation, you should understand editing at least a little bit. So use CapCut, right? But through time, where, you, where you're hiring people, you don't have to understand everything they're doing, but you have to be able to ask them how you want it to be because at the end of the day, you have to drive the structure for them so that they understand what they're doing. But yes, CapCut, Adobe Premiere Pro, two best ones. Editing takes a long time to master because you combine technical skills with story uh, storytelling, right? So it's not easy. But if you understand good editing, it remains the same no matter what tools you use to edit. And if you have no money, you have to learn how to edit. But if you have money, you can hire an editor, you can get some cheap editors, but we'll talk about this when we talk about automating in a different module. And so that was basically a very short run over of how to edit videos um, for YouTube, for YouTube automation. Um, and I hope you guys got some value from this one. Well done for getting it up to 4.1. We're going to make our way now to 4.2 where we talk about thumbnails. Hey guys, welcome to module 4.2. One of my favorite topics is how do we craft high CTR thumbnails, click through rate. And it's a comprehensive guide on how to do this. I think thumbnails are one of the most important things when it comes to YouTube automation. And there's four, three main reasons, right? YouTube is competitive, right? Very, very competitive, and everybody is fighting for viewer attention. Your thumbnail is actually one of the first things people see when they are looking at clicks, uh, when they're looking on stuff on YouTube to potentially watch and click on, right? And so it's a super important factor in driving clicks, and it has a huge impact, a tangible impact on impressions and views and all that kind of stuff because it impacts your CTR, your click-through rate. The more people that click, 
the more likely YouTube is probably going to show it to more people if the content is good. The psychology of thumbnails is super important, right? Here are four things that you should look to do when you're doing thumbnails. Number one, colors and contrast. You want to be bold, stand out. You want to use really nice colors to stand out against the whiteness of YouTube. It is so white, right? So you want to use colors that get people to click. Yeah, reds and blues and yellows, greens and all this kind of stuff gets people to click. There's a psychology behind colors and I've wrote it here, but listen, it depends on what you make, what you do, what you want to stand for, the kind of content. You can use multiple different colors, right? As long as it's actually going to stand out in contrast, right? Text usage. Short, impactful phrases in large, readable fonts. You shouldn't be like filling in with a whole bunch of words in there, right? It should be just like one word or a couple of words or a question or something like that, like scammer. For example, you put a picture of someone, a guy that people know, blur his eyebrows out, uh, eyes out. And go scammer behind it with a question mark and people will be able to associate like, oh, what's this about? Who is he talking about? I kind of know who this is, but is he talking about this person? You know what I'm trying to say? Everybody knows those videos, right? Human faces, right? People like the faces because it's instant emotional connection with the viewers. So you can use faces because right now you're looking at important ways to get people to connect. Words are one way but it, like to get people to connect, but a face, someone who has an emotion or a feeling or something like that, it'll get people to click. Right, even if it's recognizable people too, it's like people that are famous are going to get people to click. Right, if somebody knows someone and they want to watch their stuff, they can just see them and go, "Okay, this is a, I know this person. Let me click on this stuff." Right, and this is a way that people think about thumbnails, but it's composition. So you do a three by three grid, for example. Right, and so what you want to do is you want to appeal to that composition and ensure that there's focal points and all those spaces in between, so you can strategically stand out. So here are some ways that we like to look at this stuff, right? So these are some of the colors and all that kind of stuff. So we just go, I just go a bit deeper. I'm not going to talk about this. If you want to look at this, you could just pause and read what each color can do, does and what emotion it stands for. And once again, same thing with this one. It's just going deeper into the stuff that I've already said. Um, so you can, if you want to stop, pause and read these things and just like get a clear understanding, then you can do that. The biggest thing with, with YouTube is also with thumbnails is to test them. Right, because you want to test to see which thumbnail actually is getting you the better CTR, right? If you do one change here, what actually is the result of that change? And so this is called A slash B testing, A B testing thumbnails, right? How do you do this? At the beginning, when you're starting for YouTube channel, I don't think it's super important to A B test your thumbnails, to be honest, because you're just trying to get some viewers, trying to get an audience that cares about your shit. And then you're thinking about doing A B testing. But if you want to do A B testing, this is how you do it. This is how I do it. So I create a variation. So let's say I get one thumbnail and I make two, three variations of that thumbnail, right? For the same video. I set, I change one thing only. One thing and I test it for 48, 24 to 48 hours to see which one performed the best. Okay? There is YouTube's feature now which you can test thumbnails, which is really cool. I used to have to change them, right? You want to analyze the results and see which one got the best CTR. Okay, once you figure out what one, which one has the best CTR, that's the one you use. But you use that as a foundation to think about how you do your other thumbnails. But you still want to do the same thing. You want to test different things for each thumbnail to optimize it to a point where you have the best thumbnail every single time. And it says here, step five, reiterating your thumbnail designs based on insights from each test. This is true. You want to keep improving your thumbnails because little tweaks here, little tweaks there, little tweaks there could be a 5% increase in, increase in CTR. So you want to be at the forefront of that, right? And so that's basically it. So test them one, one element at a time. Make sure you have enough data to, that it makes sense. Obviously, it needs to be statistically significant. You can't have five views and go, ah, oh, see, this worked, right? And then obviously test it against different devices to see what worked here, what worked there. And you can use your um, uh, you can use your channel analytics to give you that insight too. And here are the most important metrics for thumbnails. You got CTR, click through rate. So the percentage of impressions that have come, and then how many people actually click. So it's how many people click divided by how many times it was shown. And the average view duration, so when people click on it, right, if they stay for a small amount of time, it can show YouTube that your video sucks or it's misleading and people it doesn't satisfy the person that watched it. But if the person watches it and, and, and it has a high CTR, that means YouTube goes, oh, this is a good video and people actually get satisfied from this video, so let's recommend it to more people. And impressions are basically just the amount of times your, your video was shown to potential viewers on YouTube. And this is the best practice, once again, for testing a, uh, to, for A-B testing thumbnails. One element at a time, uh, one element at a time, make sure you have enough data for significant results and just test it across different devices as well. 
here are the tools that I use to, to create thumbnails. To be honest, I obviously have people that create thumbnails for me. Um, these ones that can just give you a, a better understanding of um, how they work, what's working for them. I think Photoshop and Canva are the, obviously the best two. I prefer Canva um, because it's easy to do, but with a professional person, always use Photoshop. Here are some, some mistakes that people make, and it's just taken from the stuff that we learned, which is best practice. Right, number one, cluttered composition. You've got too much stuff happening on the on, on the thumbnail. Number two, doesn't stand out. There's no contrast. It just looks the same as like, I don't know, like it just looks boring, right? Doesn't stick out, doesn't, doesn't do anything, right? Misleading content is a big one right now. If people click on your video and it has a high CTR, but they don't stay, YouTube is not going to recommend it to more people and your video will go down. The next one is too much text on the picture. Way too much text on the thumbnail, sorry. It's just cluttered. It looks like shit as well. And the last one is low quality images. Like you have a blurry image or something like that. That's so unprofessional. Make sure your images are high quality and really good quality. Because if you're going to use it for your thumbnail, you want to make sure that even when they're this big, they still stick out. I like to think of it like this for thumbnails. A high click-through rate thumbnail is a blend of art and science. By applying the principles and avoiding common mistakes, you can create thumbnails that capture attention, drive clips, clicks and help your content stand out in the crowded YouTube landscape. And here are the key takeaways. Use bold colors, strong contrast, use human faces if you can, use text strategically, A-B test as much as you can, make sure you use the right tools, learn from the successful uh, thumbnails and what's worked for other people in your niches and industries. And the biggest one is always to keep improving, always iterate and keep getting better. This is 4.2. I'll see you guys in 4.3. Welcome to the final module of uh, for module four. This one's 4.3 and it's about maximizing YouTube discoverability, the power of SEO, headlines, and metadata. Why is SEO important for YouTube growth? Number one, when your SEO is in line, more people can find you through YouTube search. So when people are searching and looking for specific content, you will pop up. Number two, if your YouTube, if your YouTube automation channel has more SEO, is more optimized for search engine optimized is optimized for search engines, aka YouTube, a search engine, then it'll most likely pop up in suggested videos up next or on the side on the video sidebar as a suggestion. Number one, another third thing, sorry, is browse features. So if your channel is is growing and then SEO is really good for your channel and obviously your video becomes ranked really highly for a specific topic or a thing. Let's say it's MMA content or whatever. Let's say it's a documentary about uh, John Jones, the MMA fighter, and it ranks really high. Anyone who's watched John Jones content or is interested in that kind of content, it will be popped up in their browse features. You know what I mean? So it's like it's going to be a video that they're going to see on their homepage and they're going to be able to click on, watch, and, and engage with your channel. And then another thing is obviously like external search engines. If your channel is optimized on YouTube, then when your people search something on Google because they're connected, your video may pop up as well. And so why does uh, SEO matter? Once again, we've spoken about visibility. So if they're optimized videos, they have a high chance of appearing in search results, suggestions, and making them discoverable to potential viewers. When they're optimized for titles, thumbnails, they encourage more people to click on your videos, leading to increased engagement and viewership. When you target the right words and keywords as well, it helps you reach the right people that are interested in your video content so that you, your content is seen by the most relevant viewers. Right, And if it's relevant and engaging, it's going to keep the viewers watching longer. So it's a key metric for YouTube algorithm to tell you how uh, to see if a video is performing well or not. So improve watch time. And if all these things work together, then your channel grows. And if your channel grows, you make more money. Super simple. How do you create headlines that drive clicks? Right. So your headline is one of the first things people see with your thumbnail. Your thumbnail and your headline make something called a package. They're your, your video packaging, right? It's what people see before they click and they work together. Really good headlines work by grabbing attention, sparking curiosity, and clearly conveying what the video is about. Clickbait doesn't work anymore. How do you do this? So you can use power words, you know, something to, to emotionally charge the headline. You can use numbers, right? So if you want to make your headline more specific and attention grabbing, you can do like seven proven ways, top five this. These are the five things I didn't know. You know what I'm trying to say. Everybody's seen these videos. I don't have to explain them, right? You can ask questions. You know, if you if you leave an open in the question with the headline, you answer with the thumbnail. People will go, is this the answer to this question? We're going to see. I'm interested. You know what I mean? Uh, a lot of people do brackets for context. 
So like, for example, I'm going to say, in this video, I'm going to have in the thing free course, you know, free 10 hour, uh, how many hours is courses, whatever, in brackets. So it gives more context, it gives more intrigue, and it actually works to give people more understandings about the content, right? Number five, it's curiosity gaps. If you create valuable information, don't give it all away at the beginning. You want to get people to know that there is their answer to this kind of stuff, and they will get the answer for whatever they're looking for with your video. So the headline's like, like how I did X, for example, for this thing, or I learned this and this, for example. You know what I'm trying to say? And then the sixth one is leveraging trending topics. Obviously, if something's gone viral, something's big that's happening in the world, everybody's talking about it, it's very easy to talk about that stuff in the headline and get people to click. How do you look for keywords for YouTube videos? So you can use stuff like TubeBuddy, which is a tool for YouTube that kind of finds keywords for you. You can use VidIQ, but these cost money. You can use something called Google Keyword Planner, which is free if you have a Google Ads account. Um, but the best way, honestly, is like YouTube auto suggest. You could just type in the stuff and see what people are really searching for and create content. We've spoken about this before anyway, using YouTube search as a way to identify content ideas for your videos. And actually, if you do that, it makes more sense because now it's optimized for YouTube because people want that and you're solving a problem for YouTube where people come there for value and you're going to create that value for the audience. They're going to share your video to more people, right? Um, so optimizing titles, descriptions, and tags. Um, uh, a big thing with titles, descriptions, and tags is, you know, you don't want it to be too long. You want it to be an effective title length. You want to have some of the keywords in the title, in the description, and obviously with the tags, you want to have relevant tags in the tags. And this is super important for uh, video metadata. Once again, accessibility is a big thing. Boosting search engine optimization so you rank higher, more people see it. If it's, if it's, if it's going to be seen by the right people, it's going to have better watch time. So it's going to be shown to more people in that industry because it's relevant, right? Some people, um, they can't, they, they, they aren't able to hear it with sound. And so you need to be able to cater for them as well. And what the biggest thing is like with, with, with video chapters or making your video, um, uh, as, as optimized as possible, you actually enhance every user's experience on the platform because they come, they get a solution to their problem through your video and your video is the way that they get the answer to this, to their problem. We've spoken about how to find competitors um, uh, for YouTube, so I'm not going to go through this again. But just to recap this, you want to identify the top channels that are ranking well for your keyword. You want to analyze how they write their titles because it'll give you a good example of what they're doing, right? Because the titles and their thumbnails, right? You want to study how they write their descriptions as well to see what you can do for your descriptions because you can. There's, there's nothing better than doing what already works for somebody else, but just doing it better than they can. You want to examine the tags. There's a lot of tag extracting tools that you can use to pull out the tags from your competitors' videos to see what kind of tags they're putting in their videos to rank better. Um, you want to review their strategy for content. Like, what are they actually making content about? What's their game plan? How are they producing content? What is their whole point in the channel? What is the what is the unique value proposition here for this channel? Right. And you want to see if the channel is, has engagement. Look at the comments. Look at the likes. Are people engaging with the channel? Are they saying thank you? Are they looking for other options? Are they saying this is not good enough for them? Just look at what the comments are saying, bro. They'll tell you from the word of the people that you want to create content for what's working and what's not working for them. And here's the conclusion. Cry, cry, craft compelling keyword rich titles that accurately represent your content. Use tool for in-depth keyword research. Optimize your description with keywords and comprehensive information. Analyze competitors to stay ahead of trends and identify opportunities and make sure your content is, is relevant to your audience because time retention is the biggest indica indicator that your content is relevant. I thank you guys for uh, getting up to 4.3. We finished four, uh, module four, we're up to module five and there's only five, six, seven, uh, sorry, yeah, five, six, seven, eight. There's only four modules left. You read that one, two, three, and four and you only got four more to go and you are basically ready to start your channel. So I look forward to seeing you guys in module number five with 5.1. Hey guys, welcome now to module five. In this one, we're going to be talking all about growth. I want to say that growth is an idea and it's more strategic than actually the stuff that you guys have learned up till now. Everything you guys have I've learned up till now is more practical things that you could do to, with your channel to get started. Um, and it's basically more for launching from zero to one and getting your first 10, 100,000 subscribers, right? But when we talk about growth strategies for YouTube channels, we're actually talking about more, how do you go from now 
a thousand, five thousand to fifty thousand, hundred thousand, bigger channels, more revenue, bigger businesses, basically. And so we're going to be talking about a few things here. These are all strategic, and some of these can be implemented straight away. And there will be some lap um, overlapping from stuff that I've spoke about before. But we're going to go deep into some growth strategies. And so we're going to be talking about a few approaches that I have used to be successful with YouTube automation to grow. How do you increase channel visibility? How do you engage your audience? And at the end of it all, taking all these strategies to help you hopefully grow your subscriber base. Because at the end of the day, the whole point of YouTube automation is to grow your channel, grow your, grow your subscribers so that you can make more money from the same channel and then take that money and build multiple channels. And this is where the power of scale comes for YouTube automation and actually one of the best things about YouTube automation. So let's talk about engaging with your audience, right? There are three ways that you can engage with your audience. We've discussed this before, but we'll discuss it again. So you've got comments, you've got community posts, and you have polls. So how do you engage with comments? With comments, you want to do a few things. You want to respond promptly. If they're a good comment and you want to respond to a lot of the people that are commenting on your videos, try to do it within the first 24 hours of the video because it's going to give people a chance who are reading. The, a lot of people just go to YouTube and read comments while watching videos, right? And if there's some back and forth discussions and talking and all that kind of stuff, it makes your video, your community look more alive. You really do want to encourage discussion. So if you do respond to people, ask questions, leave it open, let them interpret things, let them respond, because it creates that sense of community that you want to find anywhere else, right? Especially if it's about the same things that you enjoy. If there are co comments there that are thoughtful and you think other people in your community would really benefit from them, then you could pin the really good ones. You want to also think about what people are asking and what people are saying in your videos. If there are a lot of people asking you to talk about or address videos in the future, make a video, for example, do it. Show that you're listening to these people because then they feel more engaged and connected with you. Because at the end of the day, you don't have a personal brand, but you do have a channel. And if the channel can connect with these people and make content that they want, then you're going to have really strong, engaged audiences. And if you can't comment, which I think you should, but if you can't, then at the minimum, use hearts and thumbs up. So you at least acknowledge people and make them feel appreciated. That's, where you, that's how you build really strong connections between the channel and the people that are watching your channel, your audience. Now, polls. I love polls, right? Polls are really good for creating metadata opportunities. So if you want to just do like really generic polls to get people to click and engage and all that kind of stuff, it's really good for the YouTube algorithm. But there are a couple of things you can do with polls too. You can give people opportunities to tell you what kind of content they want right? You can also do some research on your audience about, you can ask some questions and de like demographic preferences, all this kind of stuff. And, you, and with your polls, you'll be able to understand what they are thinking, what they want, their res responses, their reactions, everything. It creates that really strong intimate connection because you could take the poll data and then start re reshaping your videos to help, you know, keep yourself engaged with your audience. Once again, engagement boosters. When you create fun polls, it increases community interaction and it keeps people engaged and it's just, it's just great work, right? And feedback. If you make a piece of content and you want people to tell you how it was, put it in a poll and see what they say, right? Not only does it create that connection and engagement, but they think that you care and you actually do because you're actually putting polls out to see what they want, what they're saying about your video, what they like, what they don't like, and there's people going to comment as well. So they might respond to your poll and comment as well. And the last one's community posts, right? Community posts are really good because you can actually just like build, uh, once again, an engaged audience. You can talk about what's happening. You can share fun memes. You can do questions and answers. You can do teasers, exclusive, exclusive information. There's so many things you can do with community posts, right? So if you're someone who's building your YouTube channel, you should definitely look at your community section. Polls, posts, engaging with comments, like actually build that connection with your audience because you don't have a personal brand as much as someone who is a face of something with an automation channel. The second part of the growth is if you can collaborate with other YouTubers and influencers. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a bit harder when it comes to YouTube automation, but there are still opportunities that you can find where you can engage with other people that are in similar niches or shoulder niches and create great pieces of content together. Um, like, for example, I had pieces of content where I was doing, uh, let's say, for example, I was doing an MMA video and I was able to connect with someone who was like someone who, who did really in-depth um, research into the fights. But I did videos about the, the fighter. So we, can, we connected a video and we had an opportunity where we were able to connect, make a great piece of content, get a lot of views. So there's opportunities where you can connect with people and you can cross-promote each other in even the community tabs. 
And there's a lot of ways that you can do this, right? It's harder with YouTube automation, but it still can be done. There are some ways that you can find people that are uh, in the same spaces or, or collaboration partners. You can look for people in similar niches and just reach out to them, build that connection. You can also find creators who kind of match your skills or uh, complement, uh, complementary sorry, to your skills. And you can create unique, engaging content like that. Find people with a similar audience size, or you can talk to someone before pitching to them and engage with them and build a relationship with them. Because if you can find someone who's able to, has got a bigger audience than you and they share you, then you can grow faster. And here are a couple of collaborations. Now, once again, this is very difficult with YouTube automation, but something to know that if you, if you want to do that, you can do these things to help you collaborate with other content creators. And here's some best practices. So you want to be clear with your communication. You want to show that there's mutual benefit. You know, you want to promote them as much as they promote you. You want to be consistent. And once again, just remember that there might be some legal stuff that you want to, you want to outline to make sure that when you do the content ownership, when you do release a piece of content, how does that look? What's the split? If there is a split, for example, just be very clear about that as well. And one of my favorite tools, actually, the third strategy for growth that I love for YouTube automation is cross cross promotion strategies. So if you can, once again, YouTube is your house. That's where you're going to build everything. But if you can do stuff on other platforms like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, you can actually build your audience and they'll come to your YouTube channel thereby building your YouTube channel. So don't neglect other social media channels, which will be very helpful in building your whole entire channel, YouTube automation channel, because all these ones are like inputs into your, into your big system, which is the YouTube channel. You also, once again, you, you, you want to think about email lists. Right? A lot of people don't care about email lists. A lot of people don't care about, not even just email lists. You want to think about communities and 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 um, if you can start up a Discord or a Telegram or whatever it may be. Because what's going to happen is like when you go live or when you have a video go live, you can just get people in that Discord to come to your video straight away. And so you get that initial boost instantly, meaning that if they get good watch time, all this kind of stuff, YouTube will recommend it to more people. If they click on it, watch it till, till the end, they engage with the video, you're sending YouTube very positive signals. And, and this is just going a little bit in depth into how you can integrate with social media. So if you wanna focus on platform, you wanna focus on platforms where people, your audience is most, most active, if you have a business channel on YouTube, LinkedIn probably, like if you have more like a, a development, like self-development, self-improvement channel, you can do Instagram, that works really well. If you have an entertainment, TikTok it works really well, for example. And so, but the thing is your YouTube content is different when it adapts to those platforms. So you have to understand those algorithms and we can make, we can have conversations about how to understand those algorithms in another video. But once again, it's just posting content to the people that are liking that content and they'll follow you on those platforms and then come to your channel on YouTube. The main thing is you wanna be consistent with your branding regardless though. So use the same profile pictures, use the same banners, the bios, everything like that, because you wanna be consistent across all platforms. Right, and a lot of the bigger players on YouTube do teasers, trailers, and behind-the-scenes content on social media channels like Instagram, like TikTok, like all these platforms, and then they bring them up towards YouTube. Email marketing, or we could talk about community building on other platforms like Discord or Telegram. It's really simple. When you're building your YouTube channel, you can just have a link, or you can have somewhere they can sign up. You want to do this so you own something, where it's like if something happened to your YouTube channel, you still have that audience owned. And that's a really big important thing. I've had channels that got deleted or I lost thousands and thousands of people that are part of my audience and I can never get them back again. So you wanna have off platforms. So email marketing lists, you wanna have um, email lists, you wanna have Discord communities, you wanna have Telegram communities because if something happens to your channel, you wanna be able to take them from the Discord and be like, here, this is my new channel. Everyone comes up to this channel. This is where I'm gonna be posting my new content because if something does happen to your channel and you don't have this set up, you're gonna kick yourself for it. Once again, we talked about cross-platforming, repurposing content on YouTube to platforms like Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever it may be. But you wanna make sure that every single platform that you link to all comes back to YouTube because YouTube is where you're going to be making the most money. To be honest, that is just, that is just a fact, right? So you wanna bring everyone back to YouTube. And that's basically 5.1. You wanna consistently engage with your audience through comments, polls, community posts, you want to seek out mutually beneficial collaborations if it makes sense for your channel. And you want to leverage other platforms and other uh, other where, areas to build communities like Discord, Telegram, all these places. So you can also um, keep your audience if something happens to your channel, but also bring them to your videos when you go live. And that is 5.1. I will see you guys in 5.2. Welcome guys to 5.2. 
We're talking about audience retention, engagement, and maximizing YouTube performance. This video, this part of the course, sorry, is really important because we talked about script writing, we talked about retention, we talked about engagement and all this kind of stuff, but why does this stuff all matter? And so I feel like I didn't do the best, best explanation of those things and I'll do it in this one, where I can really explain to you guys why understanding, improving audience engagement actually leads to more growth on the platform. So we'll go through this in this video. Basically, we're gonna be talking about YouTube is competitive and really it's the one who keeps the videos engaged and people watching your videos who's, who wins on YouTube, especially for YouTube automation. We're gonna be talking about maximizing audience retention. In this one, we're gonna actually go really in depth into the stuff that actually maximizes audience retention so that the other video actually makes more sense now as well, the other part of the course, and growing your channel and improving yourself in front of the algorithm so we're going to be talking about the stuff to help you get improved um, with your ranking, with the YouTube algo. Once again, we have spoken about all these things, but we're going to go really in depth in this video so you guys get everything that you need to know from now on. No questions asked. If you un if you watch this video, you'll understand everything about the re about retention and why it matters for YouTube. First things first, how do we understand and how do we get this data about retention? Well, YouTube has this beautiful thing called YouTube Analytics, and we can do a video about understanding YouTube Analytics, but these are the most important things that you have to understand. So you can go to your YouTube studio, you can click on analytics on the left, you can click advanced analytics and it'll pop up, this, this tab will pop up. What you can do is you can analyze how long people are watching the video, but you can also see, see things like impressions and average view time and uh, watch hours or money made from a specific video. Or, you know, if they, for example, um, only stayed for 30 seconds for one video, they stayed for five minutes for another one, you can see what pieces of content actually worked with your audience. What you're able to do with this is actually understand what's working, what's not working, and it's actually so important that you understand YouTube analytics. It's like non-negotiable. The thing that you should look at though is your retention graph. Do you wanna identify if your videos have any sharp drops or people leave too soon, or there are peaks where people are rewatching, gradual declines. You wanna understand and actually turn your content into this modular form where you go, okay, so this is the first part, which is the hook area, intro. This is the value slash retention part. And here's the CTA or the ending. And this is where it's happening, right? Because when you identify these weak points, you can actually see where you're losing your viewers and use that to formulate your judgment for the next video that you are going to upload. But the same parts analyzing your weak stuff, you can also analyze the parts you did really, really well. And so with the stuff you've done well, do it again, but whatever the new video is and the stuff you've done not so great, change it up, right? This is, this is it's not it's not a science, it's, it's more of an art, right? It is a science because you get data, but it's it's an art where it's like you're testing, you're experimenting, you're trying this out, you're seeing if this works, right? Because it might not actually improve anything in the next video, but over these little adjustments that you make through time, you might actually see that comparing first video versus 10th video versus 100th video versus 500th video, it's gonna be patterns. You're gonna see where you're actually doing the thing and you're gonna identify the actual opportunities that you've done that have worked and actually improved your channel. And then when you do find that, you wanna set these as benchmarks, right? This is the minimum that we're looking to get for view, view um, the duration of watch time or the minimum amount of time that they spend on the video or the minimum CTR or the minimum this. There's a lot of things that actually become way more scientific after a certain point, after you've done all the experimenting. And what I recommend is you have a document of things you've tested. Has it been, pro has it actually worked or has it not worked? Right, I use the traffic light method. So if I test something, I'm, I hypothesize. If I do this, then this will happen, right? Then you collect some data and then you say, either you've proven the hypothesis or you've disproven it, right? And that will keep you learning and understanding what's working and what's not working. Once again, these are the two things that I look for. These are the most important things for me anyway, with YouTube specifically. Average percentage viewed, so how, what percentage of people have watched your video and the retention graph. So that graph where it's like you can see the drop-offs and where people are jumping off your video. And basically, these are the four things you wanna do. You wanna identify the sharp drops. If like you're watching something and goes, whoop, there's something there that happened that people didn't like and they left, right? You wanna analyze engagement peaks. Where if it's like really high at a certain point, you wanna understand why that is. If there's a gradual decline, it might be that your script is boring and nobody cares and the video actually doesn't have like enough value in there to keep people hooked. And you wanna also remember that it's not one-offs. You wanna do this over multiple videos. 
Because if you do it one time, it's not enough data. But if you get 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 videos, then there's enough data. That's why Mr. Beast is such an animal. He understands everything when it comes to retention and data and everything like that. And analytics is his bread. Like, that's how he wins. He looks at analytics and he's able to understand if a video is going to actually do better or worse. It's, just, it's, it's, it's experimenting to a point where you understand enough data where you don't have to experiment as much, where you know what's working, you know how to do it, you know what's worked in the past, you know this hook works here, or that thing works there, or how to do this, or the pacing, a lot of things, right? And so, like we said before, you wanna act on this, right? You wanna identify weak points, strong points, set benchmarks, and you wanna use a lot of videos so you're comparing it with a lot of data. How do we do hooks properly? We've spoken about hooks, let's actually go a little bit like into it. With hooks, you wanna start off with a bang, right? You wanna get people hooked. That's the whole point, that's why it's called a hook, right? It's like a fish, you know? The, 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 it's like the little thingy and you wanna catch them, you wanna get them, right? You can tease what's coming. You can ask questions that get people curious, right? You can use pattern interrupts, like I clap my hands and I go, welcome to this video, or something like that, right? Or you wanna make statements that are, seem a bit like, oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a bit of a statement, right? So what I'm trying to say is with the hook, you want to be interesting at the minimum. You just want to get people to be like, wow, like this guy is this guy is going to get me hooked, right? This guy is going to have, or this girl is going to have this video that's going to really solve my problems, if that's a problem-based video. Or this video is actually going to, is very interesting. I'm actually very keen. Or why did he say that? Let me see why he said that. Does he have actually something to prove what he just said? Like if I say, weight loss doesn't exist. And I'm like, people are like what do you mean weight loss doesn't exist? You know, like it's, it's those weird, like those statements or those hooks that just people get, they get people asking questions, even if they're not there with you. They're just like, what are you talking about? That's super important when it comes to hooking people. Pattern interrupts. We talked about it before as well. So once again, you want to be making sure that the video keeps people interested, right? You want to do visual stuff like B-roll footage or different angles or the way you talk to them or you add a visual part to it. Right, audio, maybe something goes like a, a sound effects or music or it goes up in volume or goes down in volume and gets quiet. You know, it's like, what's happening? Why is it going quiet? Or sad music starts to play or really exciting music starts to play. It's like, I'm getting ready for this. I'm getting excited. You know, tone shifts is like a big one too, where it's like you go from really exciting, happy or to like really low moments. Like, oh, we we're going to climb Mount Everest and we're going to climb this mountain. But, you know, we had this happen and this happened. It's like, oh, but we didn't stop. We did this. You get what I'm trying to say? It's like that consistent, like, like, oh my God, I'm on this roller coaster with you. Perspective changes are a bit hard with, with uh, YouTube automation because you're, you're trying to introduce new characters or new people or new points of view, but you can still do it. Unexpected elements though also really work, like jokes, challenges, elements that people didn't expect to happen. You know, something like a meme popping up where it's like just you didn't expect it or like a joke. It works really, really well. Um, we, we talked about pacing techniques. I'm not going to go deeper into this one in this in this part because pacing is is going to be very different based on your channel. Obviously, like I like the roller coaster method up and down, but you could do a lot of different pacing techniques. A lot of them, diff uh, a lot of pacing techniques exist for YouTube automation. You just got to see what works for you. Now, how do you get people? Re like, uh, what's the structure for retention? So. The big thing is like, you want clear sections. If you can divide it into like a story, where it's like, this is what happens here, 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 then people can follow the story and it's really good. But another way you could do it is like, you call back to something that happened before, right? Like I was on this plane, but then I remembered I forgot this at home. And then you took, and you, you call back to that time when you were at home, for example. Open loops, right? So the, there's a lot of ways that you can start a story or an idea at the beginning and then you solve that problem later. So it's like, like, oh, I bought this car and it just had to go into an accident and I had to do this and this and this to solve the problem. And then you talk about it later. You solve the problem later. And you'd be like, well, well, you just let it play out, you know, and people are actually interested and want to see if it actually plays out, even if it doesn't, right? I joined a jiu-jitsu competition and I've done X, Y, and Z, for example. Now, I know it's a bit different, diff different with YouTube automation, but it's concepts, right? It's concepts and ideas that you do. The peak end rule... And the cliffhangers is also another thing if you have like a series of videos. Um, but once again, it depends on your channel, right? I think retention is also just a factor of like having really exciting scripts or, you know, something that actually solves a problem 
or actually, you know, creates value for your audience. So if you create a video that's entertainment, it doesn't have to be super like story driven. It could just be entertainment video and people will still watch it till the end because they, they just want to watch something that they enjoy about a topic that they enjoy. Like if you create like the best best goals in, in 2024, um, uh, whatever, in 2024 basketball league or whatever it may be. Then it's like, you know what I mean? It's like they, they want to watch it because they like basketball. So it doesn't really matter if you have like a really in-depth structure or whatever it may be. Another big thing is you also want to get people to engage. Once again, engagement is like a really big thing for YouTube. They want to see likes, they want to see comments, they want to see shares. So just ask them to do that in the video and they will probably do it for you, right? Or just leave a comment saying, if you like the video, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. It's super easy, super simple. Makes sense. I don't know. I, this is like common sense stuff, right? You want There's a reason why every YouTuber does this or every channel does this, encouraging viewer interaction. It's for the fact that it helps them grow their channels. We talked about community in the last one. We're not going to talk about community again, but we will talk about live streams. If you have an opportunity where your channel is YouTube automation, but does have an opportunity for live streams, there are crazy ways that you can use live streams to actually make, you know, 10, 10, 15, 25%, 30% more a month just from live streams. But they have to be stuff that you can run without you being there. And so you have to figure out how that will work for you. But if you can figure it out for, for your channel, then live streams are a very untapped resource for your channels that are doing YouTube automation. Once again, the conclusion to this 5.2 is you want to understand retention data, understand your viewer behavior. You want to actively engage, uh, uh, encourage likes, comments, and shares. You want to have hooks, pan interrupts, and pacing if it makes sense for your channel. And you want to build a community if you can through live streams, if there's an opportunity for you to do it through live streams. Thank you guys for watching 5.2. and 5.3, I think we're going to talk about one of the most important things, right? We're going to be talking about monetization, how to make money that's not just from YouTube ads. And I think a lot of you are gonna love this one for YouTube automation. Thank you guys for watching. Welcome to the final module of module five. This is one of my favorite. It's monetization on YouTube. And this is one of my favorite things because this is the stuff that I think is some of the most important. It's the monetization and it's the strategy, right? With YouTube automation, because you can outsource everything else, but you don't outsource monetization, you don't outsource strategy, right? And so in this one, we're gonna be talking about revenue strategies for YouTube. We're going to be talking about how to get monetized on YouTube, how to make money off YouTube, how to actually build opportunities off YouTube to make money as well, because that's really important when it comes to doing YouTube automation in the first place. It's a business. You want to turn views into cash. So we're going to be just, just going all, all the way depth into this, and I'm going to teach you guys the strategies that, that do exist, and you can implement them into your strategy for YouTube automation to maximize revenue from a channel. So once again, we're talking about how we could turn YouTube automation into a sustainable business. We're going to be exploring monetization strategies. And I'm going to give you guys my guide on how to do this. So the first thing is ads, right? So that's the big thing a lot of people talk about is getting monetized on YouTube. And how do you get monetized? Well, you do it through the YouTube Partner Program. And so the YouTube Partner Program is how YouTube channels actually monetize their content directly through the YouTube platform. But there are some eligibility requirements. You need 4,000 hours of watch time and you need 1,000 subscribers at the minimum. Now, there are other ways that you can monetize earlier. And there's like, there's like a thing now where you could do with 3,000 subs or something, something like that. I don't, I, I'm always about the long form content because you could do it through YouTube Shorts as well. But this is not a Shorts channel. This is, this is about doing YouTube automation for long form videos. So there's a way you can do it through um, uh, other ways, but we're talking about the actual proper monetization for long form videos, which means a thousand subscribers, 4,000 hours of public watch time in the last 365 days, 12 months. And you have to be in a country where YouTube partner program is available, but also you can't have any community guideline strikes and you have to follow all of YouTube's monetization policies. So there's a lot to it, right? And so the process is you, you apply for monetization, you review it, you can, they review you once you get approved, you connect your AdSense account, they review, you review it all, once you connect your AdSense account, you've done your little pin thing, then basically you're monetized on YouTube. And there are some best practices to, for, uh, for YouTube's partner program, consistently uploading, creating advertiser-friendly content, you want to diversify your content within your audience's niche to make sure that you're doing a lot of cool videos that get more views, you want to make sure your titles, description, tags are all optimized so that you can maximize your success of getting into the program while also hopefully making more money. This is what we spoke about before, how to get monetized. And we talked about the application process as well. 
And we talked about the best practices for YouTube Partner Program. So how do you maximize AdSense revenue? So I do it by getting eight minute long videos because you can run mid-roll ads in, the between, in between videos. If you don't have over eight minutes, you can't roll mid-roll ads. You wanna use um, uh, like, for example, spaces at the beginning. Obviously they'll put ads at the beginning. So you don't wanna put it in places where people are enjoying the content. You wanna put it in places like in, the, in between or right at the beginning or right at the end, for example. And obviously you can target high value niches. Obviously they have a higher CPM and so for that reason they make more money. So they have a higher RPM. But once again, I always say make content that you enjoy, that has an opportunity and a niche that you will stick to rather than just make content that has a higher CPM because you won't stick with it. And if you wanna optimize for ad revenue, you don't wanna have any swear words in there. If you can avoid it, you wanna make sure that you're advertiser friendly, that your 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 uh, a brand or your YouTube channel that brands want to put their ads on because if you're a channel that nobody wants to put their ads on then it doesn't matter how good your content is you're not going to make any money from from YouTube AdSense or YouTube's partner program as well. Another uh, monetization strategy I like with YouTube is affiliate marketing. So basically, affiliate marketing is like let's say for example everyone's seen this like I recommend the book I put that book in my description you go buy that book I get a commission. Same thing with YouTube. If there are opportunities for you to connect products or, or software or something like that to your channel that makes sense, has to make sense, right? Doesn't If it doesn't make sense, don't do it. Like let's say you have an automation channel about dogs or the pet market and you're recommending leashes or you recommend this and you put them in the description and people go buy those things, you get a commission. So that's another way you can monetize your YouTube channel, your YouTube automation channels if you have opportunities to add affiliate marketing. Not a, lot of, a big one that a lot of people know <clears throat> is sponsorship brand deals, for example. And you can find sponsorship opportunities. Sometimes they come to you, for example. But if you're trying to get yourself in front of a, a brand and tell them, listen, like I have your audience. Why well, you should also know your audience because we spoke about how it's important to understand your actual audience. So when you go to these brands, you can be like, listen, I have your audience. I have your demographic. I have the people that actually you appeal to with your product. Let's let, like if you if you pay me, I'll actually promote your stuff to your, to my audience, and they're more likely to take action because they're the audience that you like. Remember, these brands spend thousands and thousands, millions of dollars on advertising, right? So that if they can get right in front of the core cool audience, it's gonna like their stuff. Let's say you're a pet channel once again, and you go and partner with a pet brand, and the pet brand gives you money. They give you money, and you put their uh, product in your video at the beginning as a sponsorship, and people go and buy that product. They're really happy. It's a good deal for them. And how it works basically is they pay you for every 1,000, uh, uh, hopefully for 1,000 impressions. But it might be a different deal. But let's say, for example, you do 25,000 views a video and they pay you $10 for every 1,000 views. Then you, you get paid 250 bucks, for example. Negotiating is important, but really it just depends on if you understand your audience enough and you're able to communicate value to these brands. But that's something you should worry about when you actually have a big enough audience where these brands actually care about it. Once again, there's also channel memberships that people subscribe to your channel. You can sell merchandise. You could do crowdfunding on Patreon or YouTube as well. You know, these are these are little ways you can make more money through YouTube. But the biggest one is actually selling digital products, physical products, digital services. Um, maybe it's, I don't know if there's any physical services, maybe mowing someone's lawn. But basically this is the biggest opportunity when it comes to YouTube automation is when you have an audience and you build a product for this audience or you build a service for this audience, right? You see Prime, I mean, it's a more general, but Prime, they understood their audience. You see um, uh, Mr. Beast with his feastables, he understood his audience is mostly kids. And so what does he do? He sells a candy bar, right? Just think about it logically. It's like, you understand your audience. If your audience enjoys pets, like content, you're making videos about dogs and you're making videos about cats, then maybe you should sell stuff that relates to dogs. You start a pet brand. And then you link people because I don't know this is all free traffic. Brands are willing to pay for this. So might as well have your own thing there, right? So let's say I have a pet channel and I do dog videos. And I'm specifically about dogs. I could start a dog, dog pet care brand where I sell dog equipment and I sell leashes and I sell to, um, like combs or whatever it may be. And I can, like, I, I can source all the stuff and then bring this audience to this website and they purchase because I know that my audience is all about people that like dog stuff. It makes sense, right? And so you have to think about it deeper. Let's say you have a, a channel that does uh, beauty or beauty care or whatever it may be, and you and you start your own brand. I think there's heaps of people that are on YouTube. Oh, like what's his name? Um, uh, I don't forget his name. But there's a guy who did it. He had he launched his own 
uh, he's learned, he's on makeup brand, sorry, millions and millions of dollars that he's made from just the makeup brand. The YouTube money doesn't even is like a, a sliver compared to what he's making from his brand. Same thing with Sidemen. They have like Sides Plus and they have all these businesses, vodka, all this kind of stuff because they understand that their audience is going to be catering to different segments, right? So this part of their audience will actually buy vodka and they'll buy Sidemen vodka, right? And so I want you to think about that from day one when you start your channel. Is there something I can connect to this where it's like, can I connect the business or can I connect the brand or can I connect something to this channel where when I drive enough traffic, I'm driving 25, 50,000, 100,000 views to my business, I'm making way more money in the back end selling products than I am from the YouTube ad revenue. And the big thing to think about is if you're paying, for example, to get yourself in front of 100,000 people that are very specifically that audience on Facebook ads or Instagram ads or whatever it may be, 100,000 people, you're probably paying two and a half, three thousand dollars $3,000, 4000 maybe even more. I'm just saying that right now. It could be even more. But you're paying that much money. So that's all free traffic that you're generating for your business. Just think about that. That's my favorite way of making money through YouTube right now even. And so to conclude, there's multiple revenue streams. You want to be, once again, content quality is so important. It's like always, I'm like, I'm like a broken record right now. I'll be talking about it too much. Compliant. You also want to understand your audience, but you want to be able to adapt and evolve. So if you know, YouTube ads, ad revenue doesn't make, make sense for you. You can start thinking about selling your own products or your own services because that is the blueprint for YouTube. That is the way people are making money. You have to understand this, this is the thing that people are using to actually print millions and millions of dollars. It's not just ad revenue. It's not at that at all. It's about building the YouTube channels that are actually leading people towards products, services, all that kind of stuff. So take advantage of it. Like literally billionaires are being created because of this. Right? I want you to think about that. And that's module five. Well done. We'll see you guys in module six. We'll continue all the learning about YouTube automation. Before we go to module six, I want to just continue a little bit more on what I was saying in the previous module about monetizing beyond AdSense because I feel like I feel like I I, I could have gone a little bit deeper for you guys so you can under, really understand the importance of multiple income streams that don't just include AdSense. So I made this slide, I made this PowerPoint, so we can talk about, once again, we go really deep into understanding that the actual important thing about this whole YouTube game, YouTube automation game, is diversifying income. You don't wanna rely on YouTube alone, YouTube ads. Let me tell you that from my own experience, I regret how many channels that I've lost and are dead because I lost my monetization and so I just stopped posting on those channels. This is the real secret source. I want to do it. Uh, this is why I'm continuing it from the previous module because I, I really want you guys to understand that this is literally the source. Because if you're making money, it's very easy to get better people on board, hiring better editors, hiring better scriptwriters, hiring better everything and a better machine because you have more deplor like you have more income that you can deploy. It's more deployable income, more deployable revenue. So you're making these channels even, even, even better. So once again, we spoke about sponsorships, but like, how do you actually find sponsorships? Like, how do you attract brands? And so I want you to familiarize it with a few things. So when you go and talk to these brands, you understand what they want. So there are different sponsorships. You could do product placements. You could do sponsored videos. You could do brand partnerships. Affiliate sponsorships. We talk about affiliate marketing, but affiliate sponsorships, right? So if you sell one of their products, you get a commission. They're going to ask you stuff like, how much, what's a CPM? Do you have a flat rate? You, is it a performance-based sponsorship? Let me explain these things to you. A CPM is a cost per mil. So it's how much they pay you for 1,000 views. So let's say, for example, oh, if you agree to a $5, cost per, uh, $5 CPM, if you get 100,000 views, you do 100,000 divided by 1,000 times by five, they give you $500, right? As an example. So how do you work out your cost per mil? So let's say, you, for example, on average, your videos get 200, 000, let's say they get 100,000 views. You divide it by uh, 1,000, for example, so now you got 100, and then you work backwards. So let's say, for example, I, I make X dollars, let's say I make $1,000 for 1,000 views. Just to make it easy, my CPM is a thousand dollars for every for every thousand views I get. I get a thousand bucks, right? It's insane. That doesn't exist. But like, it's it's you're 
to work out how much to charge someone, you take your views and you, and you talk and you think about the value of your audience or what are advertisers are willing to pay. So on YouTube, you will have your CPM. It will tell you roughly what your audience is worth. Let's say it's $5, right? But you get on average, let's say you get, let's say you get 100,000 views, right? But you don't want to charge $5. You want to charge $10 because it's, it's, it's that audience is specifically for your videos, right? So you go to them, listen, I charge a $10 CPM. I get 100,000 views. So you do 100,000 divided by 1,000, 100 times 10, it's $1,000 for a product placement or for my um, uh, for my sponsorship or my brand deal. You could charge more if you want to. That's up to you. But you want to charge what's fair. A flat rate is, I'll just give you $50,000 or I'll give you 5,000, I'll get 10,000. The views don't matter. Maybe you get a million views. Maybe you'll get 1,000 views. You still get your money. And then the performance-based sponsorship is more like, if you get up to this many sign-ons or this many downloads or this many purchases, then you get X amount of money. But if you don't, you then you don't get anything or you get only a small amount of money. To do this and you want to, to attract brands, you want to have, if you want to attract brands, you have to be a brand yourself. You want to have a clear niche, consistent branding and a professional media kit to show your demographics, your audience, your engagement metrics, all this kind of stuff to these brands. Like, look, look this is what we get. Show it to them so they can actually find you guys valuable. Once again, showcasing your value, right? You want to show that your audience buys from you, your audience trusts you, your audience is aligned with the, with, with the sponsor or the, or, or the brand you're trying to work with. You can find these people by doing networking outreach. If you have LinkedIn, social media, just reach out to these companies and tell them that you think you're a fit for their niche. Um, there's sponsorship platforms. I don't really use those. Um, but it's always important to understand your uh, your worth based on industry rates, but you don't overcharge, but you don't undercharge. Understand, there's a lot of data out in the world that tells you how much your industry is worth. Once again, YouTube actually tells you roughly how much your audience is worth by giving you the CPM. Another thing that we didn't even discuss is licensing content. Now, I don't recommend licensing content, actually, but I put it here because it is another way to make money through YouTube. Uh, through, through your content, for example. When you license your content, you're giving it to these other people, they'll take it, they'll monetize, and they'll make God knows how much more money from it. I'm actually putting this in here so that you understand that this exists, but you have to make a decision. There are a lot of platforms where you can license your content out and you can give your content out to like these bigger media companies. They'll purchase it for a certain amount of money and then they'll go and they'll put on all their platforms and generate more views, generate all this kind of traction for them. Why give it to them? It's here just so you know, and I have put um, as a caveat, like that is only if you want to. Well, people are talking as well about products. When I said in the previous module that products, services are the best way to make money on um, on YouTube when you're building your YouTube automation channel. And how do you do it? There's courses, eBooks, templates and tools, membership sites, branded merchandise, products that are specifically for your niche. These are just a couple. There are so many more. Just put on your thinking hat and think about your audience and think about what they are looking for and what they want and then create that thing for them. You also have affiliate marketing. We spoke about it in the previous module too. And once again, relevant products. You want to let people know that you uh, have an affiliate product that you're selling, like you're putting in your description. People need to know. You need to be very transparent, right? And when you create value-based content, the content is good. And if people find that value and they want to use the same things you use, then they'll make their own decision to go to that. But you have to disclose it. It is an affiliate program. And obviously, once again, multiple touch points. We're not going to go deeper into that. But how this looks, basically, when you look at a channel that's uh, that's uh, for YouTube automation, when you're having multiple revenue streams, right? You have, let's say, 30% coming from AdSense, 25% sponsorships, 20% affiliate marketing, 15% digital products, 10% licensing, all these ones add up to your channel becoming more and more profitable, more better, better quality content, better this, better that. But the main thing I want you guys to know is that this is actually what I recommend the most. It's digital products. I think if anything, AdSense should be 10%, sponsorship maybe 20%, but like digital products should be, or, or products or services should be 50, 60%, 80% of your business. You know, that doesn't add to 100, but you know what I'm trying to say. It should be the majority of your business because that cannot be taken away from you. Once you've built that product, that, that service, that thing, and people love it and they come and they use it and there's actual market product market fit, then your YouTube channel just becomes a, a tool to bring more people into your business, a, a tool to bring more people to your product. And we're going to do a whole course on YouTube for business and how to actually use YouTube to build your business. But this is not that. Right, let's say this is for people that want to do YouTube automation and how to make money from uh, from faceless cash cow channels. 
But there is something to be said where YouTube for business, using YouTube to acquire leads or to acquire more sales or acquire more products is actually the blueprint to making millions of YouTube. And so the key takeaways, this was a short one, but it's multiple income sources, focus on value, integrate your revenue streams together, have multiple revenue streams. You have to have that. You want to be authentic. You want to have consistent branding. You want to be, you know, uh, high quality content, right? All this stuff, non-negotiable, it's a must. And you want to continually opti continuously optimize and understand where your money's coming from. What's where's your profitable, um, uh, uh, what's your profitable areas? What what strategies are making the most money? What channels are making the most money? Is it is is it maybe your ad income? So your advertising revenue, like your um, uh, monetization on YouTube, AdSense, is actually where your, most of your money's coming from. You have to figure that stuff out because once you understand where the money's coming, where the money's being created, you can understand where you need to tweak so that you can maximize that. And that's basically let's say 5.3B, because this is like an extension of 5.3. I'll see you guys in, um, in, in module six, where it's going to be all about um, scaling and uh, automation and all that kind of stuff, where it's, we think about really how do we get people on board, how do we find people, all that kind of stuff. Thank you, guys. Hey, guys, welcome to module six. And this, this, this one's only going to be two parts, right? We're going to be talking about scaling YouTube channels through automation. So hiring, who do you hire for, how do you set up SOPs, stuff like that. And the second part is going to be really thinking about um, what is it actually? Hey guys, welcome to module six. This is going to be a two part as well. We're going to be talking about in the first part, how to scale YouTube channels through automation, how to set up uh, SOPs. What do you look for when you're hiring for your first channel, uh, for your first channels team? And the second part is going to be how do you manage multiple channels? Because that's one of the, once again, one of the strongest things about YouTube automation is the fact that you can have multiple channels with just one team, right? They can be doing multiple channels, multiple videos, multiple different niches. And how do you do that? So basically, when you grow a channel, it's really important that you really start to hire and outsource the right things to the right people, right? There, there are ways you can use AI. We'll talk about leveraging AI for YouTube automation, but there are ways you can use AI, but the best thing is if you can hire people. So like someone who can edit, someone who could do script writing, someone who could do all these things. Once again, if AI makes more sense for the things that you're doing, then use AI. But I don't think AI is gonna be really good at editing long form pieces of content right now. It might get better, it might get really good at editing long form pieces of content through time, but right now it's not the best. So we're gonna be talking about that. How do you actually do automation for channels that are scaling and how do you maximize the efficiency of the people you hire so you're not wasting and burning money. So these are the couple of roles that you look at. We've spoken about the roles before for when you're hiring, but these are the roles that you wanna delegate as soon as you can. Starting off with your weakest stuff, if you're weak at something, delegate that straight away. And how do you build these remote teams basically? So there's obviously six stages. So you have research. Right, so you, obviously people that find topics or video ideas, or they look at your competitors and what they're doing, um, uh, monitoring trends. You can hire you can hire virtual assistants, but if you want to be in charge of that, I rec I respect you for that for that as well. And you want to be in charge of all the strategy and all the video topics and the ideas and the trends and all that stuff, then you can do that. Second part is once you've got the ideas, is like the script writing. So you can outsource people writing the content. Um, uh, uh, writing the script, the engaging scripts to uh, script writers, VAs, remote um, people as well. You can use AI, to be honest. There are a lot of really good AI tools like Claude and ChatGPT that really help you write good scripts. Um, but right now, if you hire someone who's a really good script writer, someone who actually does research and actually gets the best content and uses a bit of AI, but mostly does really good research and content and, and, and has really good um, storytelling techniques and all that kind of stuff, then you're better off also just hiring someone for that. But you should always proofread this script. Make sure that it's good quality. The thing that I reckon most people will be hiring for are these two. So you've got video editing, which you need to hire someone from overseas that can do editing if you can't do editing yourself. And I actually recommend through time that you actually outsource this as soon as possible because as someone who's building a YouTube automation business, your job isn't to be an editor. 
Your, G- your job is to do, once again, strategy and monetization so that you're making the most profitable channels, right? Don't waste your time editing videos. At the beginning, different story when you're trying to build off the channel. But through time, this is the first thing you need to get rid of from your plate. And the second thing also needs to be the thumbnail creation. Um, headlines, you should be doing yourself for as long as you can because obviously you understand what your audience wants. But the thumbnail, you should get someone who's a thumbnail designer, thumbnail artist, who can create multiple varieties of thumbnails so you can test them and see what's working best. Community managers, not a, not a, not a must-have. It's a nice-to-have. If, you, if, you, like, if I had to rank these on the must-haves, Video editing and thumbnail are must-haves. Script writing is good, uh, a good have, or a good have if you want. But community management, community management is is if you want to, right? Anal- analytics tracking also if you want to, because to be fair, you should be the one that's in charge of talking to your audience, engaging with your audience. If you get to a really big point where your channel is huge, then it's good to have a community manager manager where they can talk to people, do polls, do community posts, all that kind of stuff. But till then, you're doing it. And so we've spoken about these things. So how do you build an effective remote team for YouTube automation? You want to be very clear about the roles and the expectations so that each person that comes on will have a very good understanding of what they're supposed to do and how they actually add to the workflow. So you want them to understand where they fit into the workflow, what their obligations are, what the expectations are for them. You want to have opportunities to collaborate where they can you can have discussions, you can communicate, Discord, Slack, you can do project management tools like Trello or Asana, where you can have the content and you can be talking about what needs to be done, who's, whose job it is it right now to do what, um, and when something moves from this position to this position, the next person takes it on board and does what they're supposed to do. A big thing, though, is creating training and SOPs. You need to create material and standing, SOPs are standing operating procedures for every single role so you understand they understand what looks like success, what you actually want. And how I recommend doing it is like you, you record yourself, you share your screen, you record exactly what they are need, needing to do, how they are objectively going to, to fulfill the roles and the demands that you are asking for them, Right. SOPs are non-negotiable if you're hiring people because if they don't know, you can't get, you can't hold them accountable for stuff they don't know. But if you've clearly outlined the expectations and you've put it on video what they're supposed to do and you get them to go, all right, watch this video, understand this stuff and then come back to me and tell me what you have to do. If they can do that, then you've got a good team member. If they can't, that means they didn't even look at your SOPs. You want to check in at least, hopefully, weekly. It'd be better if you could do it once a day or once every two days. We could just check in, make sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to do. And you want to establish KPIs. You want to tell them, this is what success looks like for you. If you don't do this, then this is not success for me for this channel. And so for that, I will have to let you go, right? At the end of the day, a lot of these workers are going to be able to work remotely online from their homes. And the money that we pay them is actually a lot of money, which is really good for them. And so for that reason, they do not want to lose the, the, the opportunities they get. And you don't want to lose someone who could be potentially a great addition to your team. So you be real clear about it. Set, set, set your KPIs, your key performance indicators. Like this is what success looks like. And we're going to be testing this every three to six months to see that you're m- matching that demand. If you're not, then we need to have a discussion about your performance and see if you're actually meant for this role. Be as, as, as straightforward as possible. You don't want to be... Oh, yeah. No, you don't want to be lukewarm. This is a business that you're trying to build. You're trying to make money from YouTube automation. It is a cutthroat business. You want to do it right. And so basically, creating an SOP, which is what we discussed about here, this part here. Oopsie, this part here. Creating a training and SOPs. So basically, this is what an SOP looks like. You want to have, let's say, for example, we're doing it for content automation, like we are. So for example, content ideation process, you want to have a, a step for how to research, how to validate, how to approve ideas. Script writing, you want to have a template. Does it do? Does it follow this template? Does it follow this structure? Does it follow this thing, for example? Does it have this tone of voice? You know what I'm trying to say? Like, does it follow the hero journey, for example? So put that in your SOP. When you're doing the production workflow as well, you can have a pre-production uh, SOP, a filming SOP, a post-production SOP, an editing SOP. Uh, a ca- like uh, your editing thing you say it must have captions must have this must have it's like a checklist they have to have in every single video and they go through it and they ensure that everything is checked seo publishing everything is the same you have a checklist of things that need to be done 
You know, static operating procedure just means here's this. This needs to be done here. This needs to be done after. This needs to be done here. This needs to be done here. And they just follow the checklist and make sure that they've done everything that you want. And they watch your video as well to make sure that you show them exactly what you want as well. So they can watch, they checklist, they understand what the expectations are. And if they miss something, they could be like, well, it is on your SOP. Did you not look at that? Like if they don't add captions, for example, and captions is a part of your SOP, you could be like, listen, this is a warning because at the end of the day, you know what the SOP is. It's easy to follow. It's a checklist, right? Follow that SOP. Make sure that you're following it because obviously you didn't because you didn't add captions and you're supposed to check it off that you done it, did add captions. Make sense? Once again, for effective SOPs, you want to be specific, use visual aids like videos, make them easy to access and always update it to make sure that it's effective. And so here's an example of like a SOP for video pub publishing. So I put on my SOP a final review. So they have to watch the entire video, verify audio um, uh, and visual clarity, ensure graphics are in there, lower thirds are all correct. Then the next part of the SOP for publishing would be a SEO title, write a description, generate 20, 15 to 20, uh, 20 relevant tags. See, these are all like checklistable things, right? They checklist, checklist, check, done this, done this, done this, done this, done that, for example. So it's, it's impossible to miss anything. Like let's say I go through this and I, I upload the video, but then I forget to generate the tags. Why did, I, why did I forget to generate the tags? It's right here. I'm supposed to have 15 to 20 relevant tags. So that's on me. You know what I mean? On me, the one who's doing that work, it's on me because I didn't look at the SOP and I didn't understand what was being asked of me to do. And that's the conclusion. At the end of the day, automation scaling through through hiring people is the best thing you can do for your channel. But it is not to remove the human element, but it's to free your, up your time so you can be strategic and thinking about making more money, right? Now, when you hire these people, you're paying them. And so you want to make sure that everything is effective and everything is streamlined and everything has a workflow and has SOPs, operating procedures, checklists that they follow. At the end of the day, you don't want to be just burning cash for the sake of burning cash. You don't want to just burn money. You actually want to provide value through content. You want to have the best pieces of content. You want to have the best scripts, the best editing, all that kind of stuff. And the only way you're going to do that is if you work with the people that you have to ensure that they are following your SOPs, your checklists, so they don't make mistakes. Mistakes cost money. And when you're starting off a YouTube automation channel, you don't have that liberty to make a mistake, right? Even if you have a channel that's doing well, you still don't have that liberty to make mistakes. You need to be on the game. And when you hire people, you have to make sure that you show them we are not here to mess around. This is a business. This is what we do. The content is our business. And if you're not doing your part, then you're actually hindering my opportunities to make money. And so you're actually, I'm not only paying you, I'm losing out on money. So why are you even here? Be strict, be straight, be nurturing though. Help them, learn, help them learn, help them understand their mistakes. And I'll tell you right now, that is one of the best investments you can make is having the right team where you can trust them. They know what they're doing. You know you can trust them. They're following the procedures. And you just approve things and you make sure. And if there's something that isn't there, let's have a discussion. Why is it? Why, why has that happened? Let's look at the operating procedures. Is something missed here? Did I miss something? Did you miss something? Let's talk about it. That's it. That's, uh, that's the module. We're going to go to the second part now and um, I'll see you guys there. One of my favorite parts about YouTube automation is managing multiple channels because this is where the real growth happens. You get more channels, more opportunities to make money, you're in more niches, and you're able to even, if, if there are opportunities to cross, uh, cross pollinate across audiences, so you can build these even faster, right? So we're talking about, once again, launching and managing multiple channels. It's basically gonna be a masterclass of everything we've done so far. It's gonna be like a like a brief of everything we've done so far. So we're gonna we're gonna it's basically like we're starting from zero for the new channel. We're gonna talk about every single step that's needed to actually get this sorted. Because at the end of the day, starting a new channel is basically started from scratch. But now we understand, and so when we actually launch a channel, we're gonna do it right. So first things first, new channel. What is the niche? We'll go back to the niche section. Think about what your niche is, right? What is the channel going to be focusing about? Remember, the niche is the segment of audience that you're going to be talking about. The value proposition. So you want to think about the audience's value that they're getting from your channel. And like, is it going to be tutorials? Is it going to be entertaining? Is it going to be expert insights? What's the value of the new channel? Audience segmentation. 
You want to identify your target audience, their demographics, their psychographics. We spoke about this in the audience personas channel. Once again, it makes sense. This is what you need to do when you're starting a channel because you want to understand the audience, what they want, what their problems are, their pains, where they enjoy watching content. Go to the audience section if you don't if you don't understand that. Go back and watch it again because that's so important. Even for brand deals, you want to understand your audience. And you want to understand the brand alignment. So you want to ensure that each channel's branding, content, tone, everything is consistent and it has its own distinct identity. So let's say, for example, it's like I launched channel A and it's it's called Stuart's Cooking Channel. And then I launched channel B and it's Stuart's uh, uh, Recipes, I don't know, Stuart's uh, Fast Food Channel or Stuart's Chi uh, Chinese Food Channel, for example. You want to have it be distinct but they still have a, a, an, a, an opportunity for you to have your identity. Like this is my whole media company and this is, it, it's, it's another distinct version, but has similar branding, content tone alignment with the overall channels. And how do you launch these? I always prefer staggered launches. So you launch them one after another when the first channel becomes profitable. So you have the first channel you launch, it's profitability, you hire people, right? Then when you're profitable while hiring people, you start channel two, repeat the process, channel three, repeat the process, channel four, repeat the process, right? Now, and you want to develop a strategy where if you can leverage your existing channels to promote your new channels, you do that, right? So you've so the first channel is profitable, making money, all that kind of stuff. Now, the second channel is launched. You start it again, get the audience, get the content, all that kind of stuff. Now you've got money from the first channel because you're profitable to be able to build the second channel even faster. But if they're connected, you can it can connect the two audiences by going to your community page page and, and your Discord groups and your, all this kind of stuff and be like, hey, listen, you guys like gaming videos? Here's another channel where we talk about gaming history. Or here's another channel where we talk about gaming law. Or here's a channel where we talk about the best games in, in 2024 or 2025. Or like we do game reviews, for example. And you connect all the channels together. Right? And if you and what you want to do is you have an Excel sheet that has all the content ideas for channel A and then all the content ideas for channel B, all the content ideas for channel C, and then you're able to take it and go, all right, here, here's these channels, here's those channels. And if anything, when you hire your team for the first channel, they should have enough capacity with enough time to get to a point where you can do some videos on channel B with the same team from channel A. So you've already hired an editor, you've got a graphic artist, all that kind of stuff. I guarantee they have capacity to do the second channel. So now it's all about how you assess your resources and how you actually... Uh, uh, invest the resources, the time, all that kind of stuff to build a new channel while maintaining the original channel. And so with long-term growth, you want to think about what the goals are for this new channel. You want to think about, is it scalable as well? So like, is it is, is this a huge niche market that I'm actually going for now? Like I could have started off with a, a sub niche and now I'm going for a bigger niche because I got more uh, I got more resources, I can allocate more money, I could do this better. And I, I really learned from the first channel. But you want to think about what your goals are. Do you want video view counts? Do you want subscribers? Is it more money? If it's more money, then you want to do it more profitably, for example. Um, you also want to think about, is there a better monetization strategy? Maybe this is the channel where you think about using products or services to make money versus just advertising revenue. And is there other ways to collaborate with other channels in the same space to help you guys grow together? And you want to, once again, what you created for the first channel can be used again for channel B because it's the same stuff. So for content ideation and planning, you want to have centralized database of content ideas. You want to maybe do research. Maybe you have someone hired. You want to look at other channels and you want to create ideas of what kind of uh, uh, content they want. You want to create production workflows. So you've already got that built from channel one. So it's like, all right, so I get this. I get the, the idea. It gets a script written. I get um, uh, uh, the script done. The video editor comes in. The video gets the, uh, edited. The thumbnail artist comes and creates the best thumbnail possible. Uh, headline gets created. So all that kind of stuff is done. SEO, better tags, data, blah, 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 blah. Launch and get it published and start connecting the channels together if you can promote them together. And so we just talked about content ideation. But it's the same as everything else, production workflows, um, publishing, promoting, all the same stuff. Now, once you've figured out what's working for the new channel and you have some data behind you, start creating new KPIs for subscribers, view count, money, whatever. You can create those yourself. KPIs, remember, key performance indicators, like how do we know that this channel is actually doing well? 
You want to collect all this data so you understand what the retention is looking like. Is there drop-offs? Once again, we've talked about it before, and it's the same thing with channel two. But now you have learned so much more, and so you can do it more effectively, right? These are some good ideas for key performance indicators that you can use, like subscriber growth rate or average view count for videos, for example, and how you can allocate resources. And then when you're monitoring your channel, you want to make the adjustments. So if there are sudden view spikes or a lot of comments, see what happened, right? See what other channels are doing in that niche, for example, and try to beat them and try to do... YouTube is not a game where everybody eats. YouTube is the best win. It's a competitive landscape. It's dog eat dog when it comes to YouTube automation, when it comes to YouTube in general. You're, comp you're competing for eyeballs. You're not actually... There's no such thing as a zero... Um, I think it's a positive sum game or something. It's a zero sum game. You have to win or else other people will get the views, right? Especially for like trending topics. Once again, get feedback from your audience, their comments, engagement, what they're saying. You want to optimize your content. You see what's working, retention, the spikes. Is there drop-offs? Why is there drop-offs? Figure that out. Do some testing. Hypothesize again. But now you've got learnings from the first channel. So when you do it for the second channel, you're actually doing it better, right? Engagement strategies, obviously things to boost comments, likes, tags, shares, whatever you want to say, like try to get people to comment, share, uh, and like the video, uh, and maybe even a call to action to get them to join another to join your Discord or to join your Telegram group, um, and just keep making sure that you're complicit, you're within community guidelines, you're making good content, and the algorithm actually will support you. We've talked about A/B testing, we've talked about feedback loops. You want to do audits through every every um, every three months, every quarter. Wait, no, quarter is, is a quarter three months. Uh, yeah, it is. No, quarter is three months, isn't it? Three months. Every three months, do a check. Make sure that it's working. Everything's going right. Look at your KPIs. Make sure that it's all connecting. All the KPIs are making sense. You're actually going towards that goal. And you want to adapt if you're not. And to conclude, when you're, mon when you're building multiple channels, you want to be very strategic, right? Clear value, unique value proposition, clear purpose of the new channel. You want to adapt your already working workflows for channel one to channel two, so you're scaling and you want to optimize everything, every, like you want to optimize your resources so that you're able to maximize the amount of value from your team, right? Data-centric approach, always use data, see what's working, what's not working. You already have a lot of data to back you from your previous channel to know what works and what doesn't work. So when you do this channel, you're going to do it even better. Optimize every single uh, every single week, month, um, uh, but don't change strategy, but optimize. Like if something's do, starting to do well, you know, tweak it, go towards that, like thumbnails or headline copy or description copy or some little things. Just optimize and try to get uh, get towards that KPI that you've set, if that's subscribers or likes or comments or engagement, whatever it may be. And you want to see if there's opportunities to use your channel that's successful to help build the secondary channel that you build. And when you build the first channel, you can build the second channel, you take the same process, build the third channel, take the same process, build the fourth channel, then the fifth. You see how this builds an MCN, a multi-channel network? You become the guy who's got 10, 15 channels because you've got the most adapted workflows and, order and, 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 and the right team who understands how you work and operating procedures and standing, uh, SOPs in place to make you win in the game of YouTube automation. And that is channel and that is module six. Right now, we have basically finished 80% of the course. There's only two modules left. In the next module, module seven, we're gonna be talking about copyright and how to stay within the, within your legal rights with your channel and to ensure you don't get deleted, you don't get copyright strike because I will ruin you. And I've had have things happen to me with copyright claims, copyright strikes, community guideline strikes that ruined my channel forever. Became channels that were making $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 a month to zero overnight. So I want you guys to avoid what I did and really pay attention to this next module. Thank you guys for watching. Hey guys, welcome to module seven. And in this one, we're gonna be really focusing on the legalities, the really important things like copyright, fair use, the DMCA. This is gonna be a really important lesson because if copyright is not, if you make mistakes with copyright, you don't even just like lose potential money, which you will lose thousands of dollars by doing copyright wrong with YouTube automation. You may even lose your channel. And so this is a very, very, very important lesson from the business side of YouTube automation. And I want you guys to lock in and focus because I'll tell you everything you'll need to know about fair use, copyright, the DMCA, how it all works so that when you do do 
your own YouTube automation channels, you don't make the same mistakes I have made. Because I'll tell you guys right now, copyright has cost me not even just thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? So you wanna make sure that you don't mess around with copyright. You wanna be sure, make sure that you, everything you're doing is on the fair use and you're being compliant with YouTube because they will, they will pick it up. And so we're gonna go through copyright laws, fair use principles and how the DMCA works. So the DMCA just stands for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And it's the one that does all these copyright infringements and claims that you will see. So what is copyright infringement? So there are different types of copyright infringement. So the first one is like, if you're just, if you're just gonna reproduce their own content without making any huge differences to it, let's say for example, I'm, in, I'm doing MMA content and I go and I just take you the, ne the newest UFC, I'm just putting it there. I'm, I'm, I'm just adding a little bit of stuff to it. I'm cutting it up a little bit. I'm changing it up, but I don't have permission to do that, right? There is no permission to do that. Another way you, that, that cont, uh, copyright works is if you're sharing or selling copyright materials that you don't have approval for from the copyright owner. And in other ways, it's public performance, public displays. And if you create derivative work that's based on somebody else's material, but for YouTube, it's mostly gonna be reproduction and distribution. And this applies to any kind of works, musical works, music, videos, pictures, logos, software, everything, right? There, a lot of stuff that you'll see does have copyright claims. And it's very, very important that you know that whenever you do some material, to do a little bit of research to understand that, is this material allowed for me to use? Am I doing it in the right way? Or am I going to get into trouble with the copyright owner who's gonna cause me to lose money, get striked or lose my channel? And so we spoke about this before. So here are some examples. So books, articles, scripts, you know, songs, sound recordings, uh, musical performances, any kind of videos, basically. So films, videos, any other, any other YouTubers material, for example. So there's a lot of different ways that this comes about for copyright material. So it's not, it's not just something that you think is copyright. You need to know when you do use something else, it's not yours. You don't produce this. You didn't make it. You didn't, you got it from somewhere. You want to make sure that you have the, uh, you have been allowed to use it. And then we've already spoke about what constitutes copyright infringement. And here's some common misconceptions. People think that if it's on the internet, it's free to use. That's not true. Every, a lot of the stuff on the internet is actually the opposite. And it's actually protected by copyright and you cannot actually use it without, without permission. Either they think if I just give them credit, is that enough? No, just because you're giving them credit doesn't mean that it's enough for them. If you're not making money, is it still okay? It is not okay. Even non-commercial use can still be a copyright infringement. Oh, I'll only use a small portion of that material. Doesn't matter. You still used copyright, like you still use copyright work. And this is the thing that I want you guys to know. It's like, I didn't make money. I didn't, I gave the credit. I only used a small amount of it. I, it's on the internet. I saw it for free. It's on TikTok or something. Doesn't matter. If you don't have the rights to use it, you don't have the permission to use it, and you get hit by a copyright claim or a strike, then it's on you because you didn't do your due diligence. And especially when you're running a business, when you're running a YouTube automation business, you wanna be super due diligent with the stuff that you're saying, the stuff that you're using, everything. Because if you make a mistake, your business dies. You stop making money, you can't afford to pay your staff. A lot of bad outcomes come from not understanding copyright. So let's talk about fair use. So fair use is a legal doctrine that allows creators to use a limited amount of copyright material without permission for specific purposes. So if you're doing commentary or criticism or news, reporting or some other kind of research work, you can kind of use fair use. Doesn't stop people from still copyright claiming. That's what I want to say as well. Like you might still get a copyright claim. You can still use it, but you might not make any money from it. So just because it's fair use and you can upload it on YouTube and you can use it, the problem with YouTube automation is you want to make money from these videos, right? So it might be fair use, but you still might not make any money from it. You have to remember that just because they're allowing you to upload the video, they might claim the video. So every dollar you make from that video goes to the person who owns the copyright, who doesn't want you to, doesn't want you to strike you, doesn't want your channel to not upload the video. You want, he wants, they still want the video to be uploaded, but they make, you make no money. They make all the money from it. And there are some reasons, some ways to look at fair use. So, um, you know, if the nature of the copyright uh, work, you know, there's a lot of different things with fair use. All I will say with fair use is try to add as much as you, of your own stuff in there and try not to use, directly use any copyright material because it depends on how much you use the for fair use. Like if you used a lot of it and you're adding a little bit of commentary, like reaction channels are a good example of this. But, but the way you do it is like, 
if you add enough scripts and you add enough set talking and you do a lot of commentary and you, you, you actually expand on it and you bring your own ideas and your own thoughts, then you'll be fine with monetization and you might still get your money from it. But there is still a world that exists where I've had this happen to me, where I had fair use that I thought I was doing was fair use. I still got claimed. So even though I was able to upload the video, I got views, but I got no money from it. So there was no point. And here are a couple of ways that you can do that. Where you're applying for you. So commentary, criticism, parody, news reporting, satire. If you're educating on something, as long as it's not in a commercial way, it should be fine. And if you're changing the original work a lot. And here's some uh, best practices. So only use what's necessary. You want to transform the material. You want to credit the source. You want to think about, you know, if you if you negatively impact it or positively impact it, you want to see what happens with, from using this material. And if anything, you want to keep your reasoning as to why you do all this stuff. Actually, a big thing is if you can document all the proofs about the things that you have used, then when someone comes in copyright claims, you, you have an argument that can be made because this is what's going to happen. And we're going to talk about this, right? So basically, the DMCA does have a way that they remove content. I'm going to explain how DMCA works. So, so for example... You're on YouTube, you upload a video, someone sees your video, they have access to this portal. What they do with this, with this portal is that they see your video using copyright material and they have thumbprint technology that lets them know they have something similar to the stuff that they own. And there's the automatic one with YouTube automa uh, with YouTube, where it's like um, uh, when they're doing the copyright checking system, but there's a manual side too. So if that gets missed, the manual side comes in and it double checks it and makes sure that you actually have um, the rights to use that material. So they claim it or they, or they strike you or they, um, all these, so they, they do either a claim, a strike, or a remove. So if they claim, they take your money. If they, if they strike, the video gets removed, and you get a, and you get a, a and you get a strike on your channel. If you get three strikes, the channel gets deleted. And the fourth one, they just remove it. They don't give you a strike. So these three are the things that you should look at when, when, when the, when this stuff happens. But in my opinion, you should have information to back you. So if they give you an unfair strike, they'll get in trouble for that. But if they also unfairly claim you, that you get your monetization back if you can prove that you everything you did was within your rights. Um, and if you if they remove it, but you also do that as well, you can get your video back too. But you have to you have to launch the claim with YouTube itself. So you got to dispute it. You got to give you evidence. That's why I say document your evidence, and you have to give it to YouTube, and then YouTube makes the final say. And so, how do we find good pieces of content that we can actually use? Um, if you want to find music, there's a lot of ad, like audio libraries, like YouTube Audio Library, Epidemic Sounds for music licensing, a lot of places to get photos and videos. Um, and, and, you know, with AI being so good as it is right now, AI is a good one to actually produce really cool images and actually is working towards video. So if anything, all these are probably going to die in the next one or two years as AI gets much better at creating content. And I think that's where it's going. And to conclude, you need to understand copyright is non-negotiable for YouTube automation. If you don't understand copyright, you're being stupid. The second thing is think about fair use, but use it carefully because you can still get claimed and still lose money. You want to know how to handle DMCAs. You got to have your evidence, your proof of everything you've done. And if you want to use licensed content, remember AI is probably going to take over that. So you could just use AI uh, to generate videos or images. But there are a lot of platforms where you pay a subscription and you can use their videos for, for any of your content. And that's 7.1. We are almost done with the whole YouTube automation course. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys in 7.2. Hey guys, in this one, for this course, we're going to be talking about a couple of YouTube's content policies, guidelines, and making sure that you're staying compliant and avoiding penalties. Once again, if you get three strikes, community guideline strikes or copyright strikes, your channel has uh, it will get deleted probably, right? And your, YouTube, your channel is YouTube automation. You want to avoid strikes at all. It does nuke your views from what I've noticed, but if you get a strike, your views get nuked and you also get demonetized. So there's a lot of negative things that you wanna avoid with YouTube's policies and I don't recommend messing with them because you don't wanna lose your ability to make money. So we'll talk about how you can adhere to content policies and guidelines to ensure that you are stay, staying consistent with YouTube's guidelines and policies so your channel can stay successful and keep making you money. We're gonna be talking about um, some, of the, uh, some of the comprehensive, we're gonna look at a lot of the community guidelines and all that kind of stuff. And then we're going to tell you how you can be, how you can ensure you're compliant with the stuff that you do by following YouTube's policies. So there are a couple of things that if you do these things, you will get a community guideline strike. The first thing is spam and de deceptive practices. So if you do misleading thumbnails, tags, titles, descriptions, um, then you might get flagged for spam or deceptive practices. If you're using sensitive content, for example, violence, hate speech, harassment, you know, that one also will get you a community guideline strike. Violence, obviously, if you have videos where it's like talking about how to do something really violent 
or extremism, then you will also get striked, right? Regulated goods. So if you have drugs, firearms, illegal goods, any of this stuff in your videos, for the most part, I know there are a couple of channels that exist right now that are in that space and they, but I'll say right now that they probably don't make a lot of money from uh, YouTube ads. They might have products that they sell with their businesses that they're able to do. Um, I personally would never recommend getting into that space, but that could be your choice. If you like that space, you could do that space, but that's what I've seen in my time. If you promote, if you're doing misinformation, then YouTube will stop you from doing misinformation from what they think is misinformation. And you can try to argue your, your thing, but it's a losing battle. And once again, we spoke about copyright in the last video. I want to talk about copyright here right now too. So if you want to be compliant, there are a couple of things you need to do. You need to be updated on YouTube's policies, right? You want to make sure that you're checking them because they change them all the time, right? And then you want to review your content. So something that might have existed before that wasn't against the guidelines might become something that is against the guidelines. So you want to make sure that you are checking your um, content from time to time to make sure that with the new policy updates, none of your content becomes something that is uncompliant with YouTube. There's always good to be providing proper context for sensitive topics. So if you have something that is sensitive, you can you can you have to have a disclaimer at the beginning. You gotta let people know that there is gonna be something that's gonna be a bit more um, sensitive in your video, and then YouTube will actually give you YouTube will give you a pass for the most time if you let people know that the content is gonna be a bit more sensitive. Um, and just being transparent with your audience. This is why I always say always build platforms like Discord or Telegram where people that follow you on YouTube will come there and hang out with you because something happens to your channel and gets deleted. Not much you can do. But with me a transparent, it's like if you have sponsored content, you have to say it's sponsored. If you have an affiliate link, you gotta say it's affiliate. If you're making money in other ways in your videos, you have to say it. Because if you don't, you're against YouTube's policies. A big thing that happens if you're against YouTube's policies is demonetization. Demonetization kills your business. Like unless your business is making, and this is why we're talking about diversified income from a previous uh, module. But if you have YouTube's monetization as your biggest way to make money through YouTube automation, like if you're if most of your money's coming from YouTube automation and you get demonetized, it's GG's, right? You you lose your income source overnight, 80%, 90%, gone. How are you going to pay your staff? How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? And this is a really difficult position to be in. I've been here multiple times and I hate it. It's like one of the worst things about YouTube automation is getting demonetized, right? So if I was you, I'd avoid getting demonetized at all costs. Until you've built a big enough income stream that don't doesn't rely on YouTube ads like monetization, where you can get like money coming in from book sales or products that you have or services or whatever it may be, where YouTube ads actually become a little bit of your business. But still, then if you get demonetized, your channel gets tanked, you get shadow banned. So I would not recommend doing that. And once again, these are a couple of the the areas where I wouldn't I wouldn't personally touch them. If you want to go down this route, that is your choice to make. I would not recommend it. Your CPMs are shit. You don't make a lot of money from these videos, regardless from ads, because it's just not advertiser friendly. But you could do graphic violence, controversial issues, adult content, drug and alcohol promotion, excessive profanity. These are topics that I would very very much avoid doing for YouTube automation. And here's some good ideas that you could focus on, like obviously using like for advertiser friendly content. You know, don't have a lot of swearing in there. Use good thumbnails. Make sure that everything in your video is actually connected to your video. You want to focus on positive ideas, positive themes, where it's like you're building a, a, a community that's an engaged, really high quality community and always provide proper context. I can't specify that enough. And here are some things that happened, right? When you actually, vol um, if, you, if you actually go against YouTube's policies, channels get demonetized for excessive profanity. You have news channels that get struck for misinformation. Prank channels get terminated for harmful pranks. And education channels get demonetized for sensitive topics. Now, I'm not going to give the actual names or anything like that, but this is stuff that actually happens when you actually go against YouTube's policies. And this, all this is actually really bad for you when you're doing YouTube automation. And to conclude, you want to be informed. You want to know if YouTube's changing the policies and you want to be ready for it, right? You want to learn from other people that have already made the same mistakes. Don't make the same mistakes as they do, right? Be responsible with your uh, with your cont content creation. You know your pot like really adhere to the policies and make sure that your content actually sticks to that policy. You want to know your audience, understand your audience, and understand that this is the content that you're making for them. Now, if you have a con audience right now that you're being built in a, one of those sensitive topics, you need to figure out other ways to make money because you probably won't get money from ads and you probably have a lot of problems with YouTube's policies, right? And just be proactive, bro. Don't be lazy, right? Like people get really lazy. They don't check their content. They don't review. They don't look at the policies. And so what happens, the channel gets deleted and they get banned. So that's pretty much um, module seven. You guys are up to the last module, which is module eight in the next one. I want to say congratulations. I want to say great job. I'm so proud of, for, I'm so proud that you've got this far. You were this much close to being done and you're ready to start your channel.
Thank you guys. Welcome guys to the final module. This one, we're gonna be talking about how you can leverage AI and tools for YouTube automation. Probably one of the most important things right now with AI going viral. This is only gonna be one module. It's gonna be super important, super in depth. And it's like, how do you use AI tools for YouTube automation? I know we've discussed it before, but we're gonna discuss it more now. So there are a couple of tools that you can use for AI for producing for YouTube videos. And so look, there's a lot of content here that you guys will have access to if you guys wanna read this stuff and, and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna put it here and I'm gonna talk about AI, okay? So AI is gonna be one of the biggest disruptors in YouTube automation. And so you guys wanna be ready for it. And so what I'm gonna do basically, what I'm gonna do basically is that I will create a full course on how to actually use AI to make the best videos for YouTube automation, how to actually do it properly. But I will say right now that 80%, 70% maybe can be outsourced to AI. I would even say maybe 60% actually. But there are some things that can never be uh, outsourced to AI. So let's talk about those things first, right? Your strategy for content should never be outsourced to AI. You can use it to help you, but you should be making the final decision because you understand your audience the best. The second thing that should never be outsourced to AI is monetization strategies. I've already given you guys a lot of monetization strategies for YouTube that you need to be able, on, you need to be on top of it because this is your business that you're running. And, those, and actually editing as well, like long form editing, AI is not there yet for it. It is actually very far from being there for AI editing, uh, AI editing for long form videos. It might get there, it might get there eventually, but not right now, okay? So where do I see the power of AI for YouTube automation? And it's in these few areas. The first things first is when it comes to content strategy, if you understand your audience, you can actually ask like ChatGPT, Claude, all these ones to give you an idea, a list of content ideas that might work well, right? So you can use it to generate content, but it's your job to go into that content and actually see, see does it actually do something for my audience? Will they enjoy this video? Is it valuable? And look at my value framework again from early on, the modules and make sure that does it have entertainment value? Is it entertaining value? Or is it informational value? You know, we spoke about value before and value is very different things, right? Is it educational, entertainment, all this kind of stuff, right? You wanna make sure that your videos are actually have value, right? So before you do anything, you pick the ideas, you think about them, and you wanna be like, okay, is this good enough for me? Is this a good enough video to actually push through? What I want you to then do is when you have those ideas, you could just go to something like, uh, 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 what's it called, um, uh, Claude or something like that. But the best way to do it is actually to do some research yourself. But you can ask ChatGPT to do research on a specific topic, right? What you do is after you get that research, you go to something like Claude then, and that's when you get the script written. The best way to do it is to have the research and then give it to ChatGPT uh, Chat or Claude to be like, listen, I want to create a very high, high retention, high quality um, script that's going to be 3,000 words or eight minutes long um, for YouTube. That's going to have a really strong hook. It's going to be direct response. It's going to get people hooked and wanting to watch all the way to the end. I want to have something in, in between the middle to re-hook them in. Or you can even ask it to follow the hero's journey, for example, like a storytelling framework that we spoke about before. Once the script is done, the voiceover can be done through AI. You could take every part of that script and generate it using 11 labs. Um, and it'll give you the whole script. There's other tools that you can use for generating voice. So voiceover can be done by AI, right? The script can be done by AI. But now you've got the voiceover, you have the script, now you need an editor. The editor is the one who's gonna go get your clips for you, get all the parts, put them all together, boom, 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 and make the video. So now you've got the video. You have the headline, you've got the video, now you need a thumbnail. Now you need thumbnail, description, tags. Once again, you can use AI for th uh, for the description tags to give you them give you the best idea. It doesn't work always the best. You should probably know that better than um, your AI, but it can give you a rough estimate with some really good tags. But the best thing to do is to basically look at it and go, okay, so this is what it is. Thumbnails. Look, the the image generation for for um uh for for AI is, is getting pretty good. I still don't think it's there, but it's almost there, right? So you can use things like. Canva to create, like that has templates and all that kind of stuff. And you use Canva to come up with uh, some pretty good ideas for thumbnails that are gonna get people interested in clicking on the thing. Um, and then you can generate some images using Leonardo AI. I know people are using Leonardo AI to create thumbnail images, like really unique ones. 
So it can definitely be used for thumbnails, right? Maybe just not the same way, uh, maybe not the best, it maybe isn't the best, but if you have enough input and you put enough energy into it, it actually might be really, really good because I know a lot of people have used AI for thumbnails. So now you've got the thumbnails, you have the SEO, you have the description, you have the tags, you have the headline, you have the video, you upload, you, 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 you obviously look at the data. Once again, you can export that data if you don't understand it that much and you can just go through ChatGPT and go, can you explain this data to me? What am I doing wrong? Which videos are doing best? So like once you've got enough videos, right? Go to YouTube analytics, export the data in an Excel, Excel sheet, go to ChatGPT, upload the Excel sheet, be like, this is my YouTube data from YouTube, YouTube analytics. I want you to look for um, what's the average retention? What are the things I could do? Like on average, do I have this or what videos perform the best or like out of all my videos, which ones are the top three in, in uh, uh, highest highest uh, view retention or whatever? Or which which three had the best impressions? And then you go through it and you look at all that data and you'll be able to get um, some feedback so that you can continuously improve your videos. So this whole idea of AI for YouTube automation does exist. You can do it, right? And I will create a full course for you guys on how to do that. But I just want to say that it's not all the way there yet for everything. Will it get there eventually? I mean, probably, <laughs> probably, but it's not there right now. And that's the main thing. But that's guys is pretty much the whole course for YouTube automation for what I, what you need to get started from zero to launching your first channel and making your first dollar on YouTube automation. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you think this was valuable for somebody else, please share this for them. So they can see it, they can watch it, they can interact, and you guys can do something together on YouTube automation. I spent a lot of hours creating this whole thing for you guys to ensure that you guys have what you guys need to get started with YouTube automation. I appreciate you guys. Thank you guys so much. Have a lovely day. I hope to see you guys at the top of YouTube automation. If you need any more help, just message me down wherever that, wherever this may be. You'll have a way to contact me or join my community and, and speak to me about the things that you need help with if you need some help specifically with the stuff that you're doing. Thank you, guys.